All right, we are live. Good morning, good, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am Stella Kafka from AVSO headquarters, and welcome to the 109th AVSO annual meeting. As you're joining us, please introduce yourself, and we're going to start in about 15 minutes. The chat is on. Lindsay? Yes. Uh, can we enable attendee chat? It is enabled. I thought, oh, oh I guess I have to change it. That's that. okay. I there we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Well, that's something we learned new about Zoom today that um, any settings you put in a practice webinar still remain for the actual webinar itself once it started. That is good Maybe. to know. We're always learning more about Zoom. So if anyone is starting their own webinar, note that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Lesson learned. Hi, Greg, I see you had your hand raised, so now you should have audio permissions. You can ask whatever question or say whatever you'd like. Oh, I, so that was, uh, my hand was raised from the time when the chat was unenabled and I was uh -huh. trying to get you guys' attention to uh, get enabled. But uh, I've sent you guys another message in the uh, chat window anyway. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much, have a good, uh, have a great session, guys. Yep, thank you, enjoy.
So are you, as you all come in, introduce yourself on the chat. We'd love to hear where you're from. Uh, we'd love to see you at the meeting virtually. Uh, just say hi. So hello to the UK, US and Turkey. So far, we have 23 people coming in. I guess it's some, some of you are still getting your morning coffee. Hi, Chris. Hi, Pierre. Hello to Belgium. Hi, Neil. Hello, Wisconsin. Hi, Greg. Canada is here. It's apparently sunny in Columbus, Ohio. It is raining here, in case you were wondering. Hello to my neighbors in Massachusetts. Hello, India, Minnesota. Oh my goodness, Columbus, Ohio. Good to see you all. What time is in India now? Good evening, UK, and good morning to New Jersey and Maryland. Hi, Eric. Hello, New, uh, New Mexico. Good to see you here. Good morning, Mike. Snow in Minneapolis. Oh my goodness. Hello, Arizona. Hello, New Hampshire. It was pretty yesterday here too, but it's, uh, it's actually quite cold today.
Hi, Paula. Good morning. Man, it is early here, but <laughs> it, <laughs> I believe you. It's early here and it's just 10, 10 30, 11 or something. But uh, we already have 58 att attendees and people are coming, grabbing their morning or afternoon beverage and yeah. joining us. So we're going to get started in about five minutes. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see. Hello, New Mexico, Alberta. Argentina, the UK. Uh, oh, Ken Hudson and, and uh, Sebastian Otero are making us uh, very jealous. They're talking about how sunny and pretty it is where they're from. It's raining here, it's cold. It's really cold. <laughs> yeah. But you got to have some nice weather last week. We, uh, you know, the, I think that the motto of this state is that if you don't like the weather today, wait until tomorrow. It's uh, we even had snow two weekends ago. Oh my goodness! It's, yeah, I know, insane, right? I'm not complaining. Fall here is oh, unbelievable. Hi, Oregon. What? Hello, Ontario. How is it in uh, in Washington State? Cold, rainy. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Oregon had rainy. Someone it was rainy in Oregon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, the West Coast is getting it. We're having an early winter, I think. Yeah. Yeah, rainy and warm and sunny in Florida. I'm in Florida. So Paula, we were thinking at different times when we had these webinars, while we're waiting and people are saying hello and they introduce themselves, which is wonderful to see people from all over the world coming through, whether we should play some kind of music or not. Um, yeah, I know, right? And um, because of very divided opinions, we decided not. Someone had the, the courage to ask for me to sing, but <laughs> They kind of deserted the idea. 
<laughs> when, when I told them that, you know, I usually sing when we want to empty the room. I think, and now Stella's going to sing a song. And everybody leaves for some magic reason. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Just uh, watch the chat while people are, are joining us. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. And good problem, afternoon. <laughs> no the problem music. with music these days is copyright as well, especially if we're going to be posting this. Right. Not when I say. Um. <laughs> Stones start me up. I was thinking more about uh, the planets, holes. Yeah. Something yeah. like much, you know, theme appropriate and very energetic and kind of oh, inspiring. David's suggestion of start me up is very energetic. I know, I know. Oh, the stones, right? It's classic. <laughs> Nancy, no music. No, I'm not gonna put, not gonna put music. Hey, there's more negatives and positives about music. I know. So <laughs> we just got our, our vote. No music, okay. And I'm not gonna say. I love the discussions going on right now, as in what kind of music to play or not play. Um, at the same time, we're at the top of the hour, so let's start slowly. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Stella Kafka, and I am the executive director of the AAVSO, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the 109th annual meeting of the AAVSO, fully virtual for the first time this time. Uh, we have actually about 150 registrants for, uh, for this meeting from 10 different countries, so welcome everyone. Um, we still have a full program, although we understand that meeting virtually is not the same as meeting in person. Our program is aiming at connecting us all virtually and provide something for everyone. I'd like to start with some logistics. Uh, at, uh, if you are not familiar with Zoom, at the very bottom of your screen, there are two different buttons. There's a chat and we're welcoming you to use it now while you're coming in to introduce yourself, but this is going to be disabled uh, in a few minutes. And a Q&A, this is where we'd like to encourage you to ask questions for our speakers that are going to be addressed after the presentation. If at some point you have any issues with your sound, there's a drop down menu at your left low hand corner. Um, you can actually use that to adjust your settings. There's nothing we can do from headquarters to fix your sound there. As I mentioned, we have a full program. Uh, you should have received an email from headquarters with all the necessary links and information for today's sessions for uh, future sessions as well. Uh, we have uh, different, um, different sections and different kind of um, offerings in this meeting, other than this, the science program, we have parallel session, breakout sessions on observing sections, just to have a, a casual discussion of what the observing sections are about, what they have to offer to you, kind of science you can do through them and how you can be engaged. Please uh, remember we have a poster hall. I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit. We have a membership meeting and a how-to hour. So the way that the meeting is structured is that the first part is going to start with presentations and uh, starting with a keynote talk. Then we're going to go to a 20 minute break and then we have our parallel sessions. The way that it's going to work is more or less in the infographic that Lindsay shared with you. We're going to be at the many annual meeting all together. And then from there on, you have different links for the observing sections. Feel free to ju jump on different sections if you want to see what's happening, if you want to uh, actually taste a little bit of uh, each, or just stick to the sections that is more interesting to you and participate in the discussion. From there on, we have a, a virtual poster hall. There is a, a nice collection of posters. Please um, don't forget to take a look at those. Uh, a couple of them have audio as well, so listen to what the presenters have to say. Uh, they're all super interesting. And from there on tomorrow, we have our membership meeting, which is open to everyone. Even if you're not a member, please join us. We're going to be discussing our strategic plan. 
Later in the day tomorrow, we have a how-to hour, which is actually open to the full community, even those who are not participating uh, at this meeting. We have already about 300 registered for this particular how-to hour. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, giving science talks and photometric accuracy of uh, systems that each one of us are using for our photometry. So please join Greg Sivakov, Ken Menzies, and Ed Wiley tomorrow after the science sections. Um, also, what you're going to find in that uh, page that Lindsay set up is observing uh, Observer Award recipients. Uh, this year, everything is virtually, so all our awards will be sent out digitally. Uh, please also look at the uh, poster that acknowledges our volunteers. The volunteers are the backbone of what we do here at the ABSO. We have about 120 different individuals being engaged with us in multiple manners. So a big thank you to all of you who are volunteering with the AAVSO. Uh, we launched a webinar series in 2020 and the energy that those individuals participated and in, organized the webinar series was unprecedented. We, we all feel energized here because of those webinars. So we have also an acknowledgement to those individuals. Um, we will be launching a new web page soon. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow during the membership meeting. So get a preview of our new page and all kinds of uh, uh, functions in there. And also there's a link to our AVSO ambassadors, uh, our uh, uh, ambassadors to the world, young individuals from all over the world actually, who also created a video. Um, so there is a link to the webpage and a link to the video. And last but not least, a big shout out to our sponsors, individuals and companies who chose to support, support our virtual meeting. And without this support, we wouldn't be able to bring you all these programs and the infrastructure behind them. We'd like to thank and acknowledge OPSTEC, QIC, QHY CCD cameras, optical structures, first light observatory systems, and eye telescope for their support. And with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Professor Paula Scotti, who comes to us from, uh, from Washington State, where it's uh, really, really early, and who will open our meeting with her keynote presentation entitled GWLib and v 386 sir CVs containing accreting pulsating white dwarfs. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and welcome Paula. Hello, everybody. Let's see if I can share mine here. All right. Does everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Great. Happy Friday the 13th, everybody. I hope with everything that's happened this last year, we don't have any more bad things that happen today. Um, but I'm really glad I get a chance to talk to you about um, these two objects. It's something that I've been working on for over 10 years, and there's been so many contributions by the AVSO members that I just wanted to just show what the results are that we're getting out from this program. Um, so the two objects are cataclysmic variables that have um, accreting pulsating white dwarfs. And I, this work is done along with many observers with a, a few people that have stuck it through the 10 years, many of which were students when it started and are now finished with their PhDs. It's Boris uh, Odad and Paul Chode are off in Warwick, England. Uh, and Patrick Godin and Ed Zion, I think a lot of you know, um, are in Villanova and Keaton Bell is, is at UW now with me. He was an undergraduate and has come back as an NSF uh, fellow as a, graduate, as a postdoc. Um, so I think a lot of you are familiar with cataclysmic variables, but uh, for those of you that aren't, it's a late main sequence star, usually a transferring matter to a white dwarf via an accretion disk. And most of the, um, the ones that I'm concentrating are a very small subset of those that in which the white dwarf is actually pulsating. And that little diagram there with the different colors are showing what actually happens, what a white dwarf would look like if we could see it pulsating, because they're not going to be pulsating because they're so dense. They're not going to pulsate um, like a Cepheate in and out radially, but they, they're called non-radial pulsations, which are basically temperature fluctuations on the surface. 
And this just shows you one mode. There are many modes of pulsation and then you can get different, you know, dark and light spots that are occurring. Okay, and I can't switch my, for some reason, I'll do that. Okay, so um, normal, there's a lot of pul pulsating single white dwarfs. It's, you know, it's a part of their evolution and they all pass through what is called an instability structure. But the ones yeah, that I've yeah. on are different. People should probably mute if you're... <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, so a, a, the single white dwarfs are called beauty seti stars. And the ones that are accreting, the ones that, that I deal with are different in various ways because of the accretion that they're undergoing. So they're, first of all, they're rotating faster because the accretion spins them up. So we're talking about seconds versus the usual days of rotation for a single pulsating uh, white dwarf. Because of the accretion, the, the accretion heats them up so they're hotter. The normal single white dwarfs are somewhere between 11 and 12,000 degrees. Ours are more, mostly between 12 and 16,000. Um, the, they're mixed composition from that mass transfer because the secondary star is a different composition than the white dwarf atmosphere. And, and the normal white dwarfs are hydrogen white dwarfs, as you see, SETI, so their atmosphere is all hydrogen. But ours have metal content because of the mass transfer. And the metals are about a tenth of a solar composition in metals. And all CVs in general, when the, if you, there's not that many masses known, but the ones that are known, they all seem to be higher mass and it has to do with the evolution to become a CV. Um, and so they're, they're just more massive. The mean mass is around eight tenths of a solar mass versus six tenths. And lastly, the thing that's, that's really nice for us is that our objects have dwarf nova outbursts. So that during an outburst, they're really heated because of all the mass that's dumping on during the outburst. And then they go, they're heated and then they cool back down. Uh, but they cool back down on timescales of months to years. Whereas a normal CV, a normal single white dwarf, when it's evolving, the cooling track of white dwarf takes millions of years. So we get to look at the phenomena that's happening um, in just you know, a, a very short period of time, which is our big advantage. All right, so say a little bit about the instability strip. Um, this is what it looks like when white dwarfs, the you know, way that evolution is portrayed. So we have gravity on the left-hand axis here, uh, increasing toward the bottom and temperature uh, increasing toward the left. Everything seems to be backward in the usual astronomical way of plotting things. Uh, but the main point is this, the instability strip for single white dwarfs, the ZZ studies, are down here. The, the low mass white dwarfs are up here. So there's a couple up here, but there's not too many very low mass white dwarfs. No, most of them are down here. The black dots are the non-pulsating stars of that temperature. And as they go, as they evolve, as they cool, uh, they pass through this instability area here, it, which are the open circles. So everything within this range, about 11,000 to something like a little over 12,000 are the single ZZ SETI stars. In contrast, the ones that are accreting, the ones that I work on, um, this is their instability strip. So here's the dashed lines that I showed you in the last one for single white dwarfs. And there are a couple that are, you know, and this one maybe is within the error bars. There's a couple that fall within that normal strip, but most of them are out here. And unfortunately I've changed the, the, the scale, the dots here in that the dark ones are the ones that are pulsating and the triangles are the ones that are not. And you can see they're kind of mixed in there. So we haven't found any way of really telling what's gonna be, which ones are gonna be pulsating, which ones are not. They seem to be at the same temperature. So that's, that's one of the puzzles that we deal with. Here's a list, there's only 18 that, have, that are known right now. So it's a pretty small subset of all the, the thousands of cataclysmic variables that are known. What you'll notice here is that this period, this column is the orbital period. They're all really short on the order of 80, 80 minutes. They're all under that two hour. And that's good because that means that at the shorter periods, the accretion disk is not as prominent and you get to actually see the white dwarf. Here's the temperatures, they're all pretty hot. As I said, between you know, 11 and, and 16,000. These are the pulsation periods that, and you see they're, they're on the order of a few minutes to 10 minutes is the, the period that we're looking for. And there are some longer periods that are seen in a couple. The two I'm gonna talk about are here. The, the prototype DW Lee, the first one known, 
and V386SIR, which was discovered in the Sloan, so it has a Sloan name. You'll notice that, you know, there's this bunch that was discovered in the middle and they mostly have Sloan names. So the Sloan survey was a great way of finding um, these objects. And the reason is um, because they, Sloan took spectra. Um, so 11 out of the 18 were found in Sloan, which was a survey that had imaging and spectra. And all these sky surveys are going on. They're finding all, zillions of, of CVs, but we, we don't have a great way of finding the ones that are pulsating. So CRTS, Assassin, Kepler, um, they, they were imaging surveys, so we didn't see any from them. And this is, the, this is what we look for in the spectra that helps us identify if, if it's going to be a pulsating white dwarf. So the spec, this is optical uh, spectra. And you can see here's our one of the objects that I'm going to talk about, v 386 sir. All of these have the characteristic of this broad dip that surrounds the Balmer emission lines. So the, the emission lines are from the accretion disk, and this broad feature here is the absorption lines from the white dwarf. So in these systems, the accretion disk is low, there's short orbital period, so we can actually see the white dwarf. In order, to, obviously, in order to find pulsations in the white dwarf, you have to be able to see the white dwarf. In the longer period systems, the disk is dominating and you don't get to see the white dwarf. So we follow up the ones that have a spectral signature that looks like this and do fast photometry to look for that pulsation and that's how we find them. Now, it, you can in a sense isolate it by just photometry alone. And Nielsen in 2006 put together where the known pulsators were back in 2006, there weren't so many. And that's the open circles here as a function of color. So this is R minus I, these are Sloan colors versus G minus R. And you notice that they seem to fall in this little strip. So once we had all the, the Sloan CVs known, I put together um, basically where they fall in, in relation to other known, known stars here. And you can see that it's expanded a little bit, but it's true, they generally fall in this very blue area. And that's because the white dwarf is showing up, the white dwarf is hot, so they're going to appear in the blue section. But you still have to see all the stars that are there. You have to you know, do a lot of photometry on that group of stars to find the ones that, that could be pulsating, contain pulsating white dwarfs. Okay, I said the, it, we have the advantage of having an outburst and we can follow what happens in the outburst as the white dwarf cools and see what actually happens to the pulsation because that's telling us something about the interior of the white dwarf. So the two, so there's several that of the 18 that have had outbursts, most of them actually. Um, and here's the two that, that I'm gonna talk about. GW Lieb has had two, uh, 1983 and 2007, about 24 years between. And the first ever VA386 SIR has been followed since its discovery uh, many years ago, but it's only had one recently. So the prediction in theory is that as the white dwarf is heated by this outburst, the pulsation should stop because it moves it out of that instability strip zone. And then as it cools back on time scales of a month to, to year, uh, it should just, the pulsations should, first of all, at right after when you can start to see it when the accretion disk has gone away or it's kind of dissipated a little bit more and the white dwarf can be seen again, the pulsation should be shorter because the white dwarf is hotter. And then as it cools back down to its quiescent temperature, um, the pulsation should get longer and longer until they reach the values they had at quiescent. So that's the theory. And that's what we wanted to see if that was actually what was happening. Um, to get the temperature, we need HST. And that's where a lot of the, the observations from the AVSO come in. So unfortunately for GW Lee, I made plots here from the AVSO data uh, of the outbursts of GW Lee on the top and V386 her on the bottom. Um, so we didn't get any HST time on, on GW Lieb until about three years past outburst, and that was its April 2007 outburst. For V38, sir, we were sort of on top of it, uh, and we applied for time right away. You don't always get the time you apply for, so that's, that's one of the problems. It's hard to get HST time. So the two times that we have, so we had to wait until it, you know, the main disk cleared out, we were starting to, to get the quiescence time. So those are the things I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so here's GW Lieb in the ultraviolet. And that's the best place to get the temperature because the optical is really contaminated by the accretion disk to, to more extent than the ultraviolet is. We get a really clear picture of the, of the white dwarf in the ultraviolet. So, that, so that's why we use HST. 
So we fortunately were at quiescence before the 2000, five years prior to the outburst, um, prior to the, so 2002, we were able to get a quiescent um, spectrum of GW leave. It's down here at 14,700 degrees. Um, then three years after the outburst, um, it's the black, it was hot, okay, which is what we expected. It went up to 18,000 and that's three years after the outburst. Um, and then in uh, 2011, four years, it's, it's the green. So it was starting to cool back down. It's all, all right, that's what we expected to happen. But then the surprising thing happened is the last three, th 2013, 15 and 17 are all in this middle band and it's not going back down to quiescence. It's just kind of stuck there uh, in this mid, mid time zone. Um, so that was one of the very surprising things. The, the cooling is not monotonic in GW Leap for whatever reason, uh, but the optical magnitude is still at quiescence level. So something is happening in the UV um, to keep it hot. So in terms of the pulsations, there's been a lot of data. GW Leap was a prototype um, of all the pulsating accretors. Um, Brian Warner and, and Lisa Van Zyl did a lot of work. Um, so it, back in 2004, they were taking data and the, the data goes from, let's see, get rid of my screen here so I can see the, my own thing, from 97 to 2001. So there's years of data. There are these three main periods that show up. And this is a power spectrum uh, Fourier analysis that folds the data back and shows the periods very easily. So this is frequency, but at the top here, you can see what we normally think of the period as in seconds. And uh, you can see 650, 376, and 236. Those are pretty consistent periods. We also, from that HST time that we had at quiescence in 2002, uh, we were able to use a, a way in taking rapid data with HST and fold the data and obtain those same three periods. And that's what's shown here. Now this looks different. You get those little peaks in there because that's called the window function because the HST orbits are only 40 minutes and you don't get the long continuous time stretches that you can do in the optical from the ground. So that window function looks better here than it here. But those same exact same periods show up. So they were there consistently for many years. Okay, so there's as we started to monitor it, so this is one year, we didn't get HST data, but we could do ground-based data. One year after outburst, this weird period at 19 minutes started to show up. Uh, and it was, it was there for a month or so at a time and that would disappear. Uh, so again, here's the actual light curve. So you can actually see it by eye. It's about 10% you know, variation at 19 minutes. And then in the Fourier transform, that's this little peak here that shows up. This is the long period and this is the short period. And this is just a blow up of that section from zero to 0.05 in frequency, which is like right in here to show you that it's there. But it, you know, as I said, it was intermittent. It would come and go, it'd be there for a while and then it would go away. So it wasn't like a spin period or something that was really stable. So sometimes here's in 2012, we have this very clear 19 minute pulse. And other times, this is what the light curve would look like. And you know, a year later, we had something that looked like a super hump appearing with maybe this you know, 19 minute in there. And here are the, again, the Fourier transforms here on the bottom that show you what's going on. So it was really a mix. You know, we didn't know really what was happening. And the other weird thing that showed up is there's a four hour period that, that came and went. Paul Choate um, did his, you know, did a part of his thesis on GW Lib, and he he just recently submitted a paper to the monthly notices. Um, this is data from I don't know if you can read the scale there from June January to September, and each panel in here is two weeks long. So we compiled data over over a long time scale to try to figure out what was happening with these four hour the 19 minute and the 83 minute periods. And you can see some of this stuff. So here's the four hour coming in. These big variations are the four hour. And then you can see the 83 minutes uh, coming up, which is maybe the super hump period. And it's just kind of a, you know, it's no clear pattern that emerged from this very long stretch of data as to what was coming, what was happening. And I wanted to show you this because that data that he combined from all, a lot of different sources, shows you what can be accomplished with a small telescope. I mean, a big one is nice. So here's our APO three and a half meter data. It's very nice, clear. This is the showing up the 19 minute 
this is 19 minutes here that shows up. And these are the harmonics of that 19 minutes. So it's very clear in three and a half meter. But here is the NGTS. It's a 12, 20 centimeter telescope. So the gray is the points. The blue is an average. But look, here's the power spectrum. It still shows up. The prompt had, there was the prompt system is a 60 centimeter telescope. So these last two are prompt data. And again, it, that the period is still showing up. So there's a lot that can be done with just a small telescope on these pulsators. Um, HST. So we went and be, besides the spectra, we took the data in what's called a time tag mode. So we can fold it back at, at very short time scales. And this is what we, we saw. So in 2010, the first HST observation, a period of 290 seconds showed up, which is you know, kind of short. So we didn't quite you know, want to see what was happening in the progression of the time. Remember three years after it was still hot, it was 18,000. Four years after it was starting to cool, same period was there. And you can really see it. The, the other advantage of HST and the ultraviolet is the pulsations are much stronger because you see more of the white dwarf and it, they're hot. So the amplitudes are larger in the blue. So whenever you're observing in the ground, if you observe in a blue filter versus a red filter, you, you'll see a larger amplitude of the variation. Um, so that's you know, another point I wanted to make. So six years after when the, when the temperature was hot again, it, you know, not, it wasn't cooling anymore, it started to show these, what we think is the four hour modulation. We happened to catch one of those during the, the HST orbit. And then the period became shorter. It should be, you know, as it cools, it should be getting longer. So again, this temperature was hotter, so it became a little bit shorter. And then in 2015, there was a different period that came up. It's, it's, it's a little bit longer, but the temperature of the white dwarf was still the same. It was still hot, not all the way down to quiescence. Some of the best data we got, at least from the ground, um, well, it's not taken from the ground, but it was optical data. It was the K2 satellite um, pointed at that field that GWE was in for 80 days. So here's the, here's the Julian days here. Um, here's the 80 days. Um, what is showing up here, these modulations are the four hour thing. So here's, you know, there's, you know, 12 of those in two days here. Um, so we're seeing the four hour modulation and you can see it's, you know, nothing is happening for a whole string of days. And then this four hour thing comes in for a while, goes away, comes back. Uh, so this is, you know, we, we're just, you know, what, what is happening here? What, there is no repetitive pattern to the four hour modulation. During one of those, so we had four HST orbits during that K2 80 days, and we were able to catch one of the uh, HST orbits happen on when the four hour modulation was there. So the black is the HST ultraviolet light curve. And the red is the K2 data. And um, this is in higher, you know, the scale is amplified here. So you can actually see this modulation is the 19 minute modulation. So that's showing up very clearly in the optical, not the UV, but the UV only when it's during that four hour modulation shows the 275 seconds. So this ties together at least the 19 minute and the four hour modulation, they are related to pulsations, we think. I mean, the theory is still lacking to tie exactly which modes we're dealing with here, uh, but those are tied together uh, at least. Um, and and um, it's the short period is not visible basically in the optical, but it appears to be something associated with the, with the four hour modulation that triggers the shorter period um, that's, that's showing up. Now, the interesting thing is the, output, the two outputs we had of GW Liba are about 24 years apart. So in 2021, we'll be at the epic of the previous pre-outburst data that was taken um, you know, by Van Zyl and Warner, where they saw this consistent three periods. And so we're really looking forward to seeing what the optical data is gonna look like. Are we gonna be able to, is it really back to quiescence? Uh, we tried to get some more HST time and we made the, we made the first category, but we're just below the cutoff. So they didn't give us the time, but we're, we're gonna you know, reapply to see what the, if the temperature is truly back to quiescence. Um, okay, so let me move on to B386, sir. Uh, this one, we actually were able to get two HST times closer to the outburst. Um, and I just wanted to show, these are all the, 
uh, AVSO observations that came in when we put out the alerts. And I just want to thank you guys if you're on, on, the, on this call. Um, it was wonderful because HST requires us to have a, a ground measurement showing that it's at quiescence within 24 hours before the HST is supposed to go on and, and they will cancel the observation if, if, if we don't have an observation or if, it, if it's at outburst. So we've been very, we've never lost an observation yet, thanks to all you guys out there. Uh, we've always been come through and provided an observation for us so we didn't have to do any cancellations. So I'm not gonna, the data we have at, at um, at quiescence, it was low resolution because that was during the epoch when the, uh, one of the instruments failed on HST years ago. Um, but, the, but the temperature we derived from that is similar to GW leave at quiescence, so around 15,000. The two that we got, the two spectra that we got um, right after the outburst, um, so seven months after, um, this was the uh, August 2019, so the outburst was in January. Uh, so seven months after we, the temperature was 22,000. So it went from about 15 to 22,000, uh, cooling down from after the outburst. And then in February um, of this year, we got the blue spectrum and you can see that it's, it's cooling. And this is like what GW leave in the beginning started to cool down and then it displayed all that weird behavior. Um, but we're now, we're, we got it at least closer to the, to the um, outburst. This is the, <laughs> what, what it looks like in terms of the pulsation. Um, so again, V386 SIR was one of the first ones found uh, in the Sloan survey. So it's, we have a lot of data. We actually had an international campaign led by Anja Mukadam uh, years ago where we had 11 different observatories all looking at the data. And this is the power spectrum that resulted from that data. Um, it has a very, very prominent 609 second uh, pulsation and it two, two other uh, what periods that come up. These are the harmonics. The 304 is the harmonic of the 609 and then these are the other two. Um, it turns out that this 609 seconds, because we had you know, two weeks of data at all these different observatories, we have a very clear, um, a clear power spectrum. And it shows that this is actually a triplet. And if you have a triplet, the spacing of the peaks and the triplet gives you the rotation period of the white dwarf in white dwarf theory. Um, and that rotation is four days. And certainly, as I said, most of the white dwarfs we see in CVs from the uh, atmospheric fits that we do, the, the period spin, you know, the rotation periods are in the order of a few hundred seconds, not four days. So this is one of the puzzles that we had in the V386er. And so we were really interested in looking at the spectrum um, and seeing if that rotation and the, the spectrum that we can, can see from so far, it looks like the rotation, we can't put an exact um, number on it because the, the data are, are noisy, but it does look like the, the atmospheric spin is fast, um, but the pulsation information tells us that the interior spin is, is very slow. So there seems to be this split between the atmosphere and the interior of the white dwarf. So in terms of the, the pulsations that we saw from the HST data, um, at seven months, this was the August uh, 2019 data, the period was 104. Remember at quiescence, it's 609. So it definitely became shorter right after the outburst. And then in February of this year, it's a little noisier because again, that window function is noisy because the, the observation time is short, but we see two periods at 174 and 187. So they're getting longer. And this is exactly what the theory predicts. So here we are with these two systems, a normal cooling curve so as, a, as the days after outbursts versus the temperature, we've, there's been a lot of HST data on just cooling of normal dwarf novae after an outburst. The normal outbursts of, of, of CVs are a few, few weeks to a few months, right? So we, we couldn't follow them very long, but the general cooling curve, this one is for you, Gem. It's just, this is what you expect. It's hot after the outburst and then cools on down to quiescence. And then the next outburst starts. So you, Gem, we couldn't get really good data. But these two systems, because the amplitudes of the outbursts were very large, GWLib was nine magnitude outbursts, V386 was eight magnitudes. 
So these were huge outbursts that happened. So we expect the cooling to take longer. We didn't think it took, took as long as you know, 10, 10 years. It's been over 10 years for GW relief and it's still but not back down to quiescence. And here's the differences. So the triangles are V386 sir. Uh, the dot, black dots are GW leap. They both started out at quiescence. So here's the outburst in each. Here's prior to the outburst. So the temperatures we have for the two are the same. Uh, v 386 sir, here's we caught it closer to outburst. So we, you know, it's hot. We didn't get the peak because, you know, we would have, well, we tried in May, but the HST couldn't lock onto the system. So we had to delay to August. So we would have had a point in here closer in uh, of a higher temperature, I think. But um, so B386, uh, sir, it's cooling down. And GW Lieb, so here's the three years after outburst, it was starting to cool. And then it went to this flat level. And we don't have any data past that time. So these two objects, we only have two sources now. We followed for a long, for you know, decent, decent temperatures and pulsations, and they're both different. So here's my summary. GW Lieb is really strange. It doesn't cool in a monotonic way. It has this weird long period at 19 minutes in the optical and this very long period at four hours uh, that shows up in the optical, the UV, and this very short period at 275 to 373 seconds, which only shows up in the UV and only during that four hour, <laughs> when one of those four hour peaks is happening. Uh, V386-SIR is the classic so far. It's currently cooling, but we don't know because we haven't reached the point yet where that 19 minute thing started to show up in GW Leap. So uh, we really want to follow V386-SIR as it goes down, you know, as the years go on and see if it's going to develop this odd behavior that GW Leap shows, which is showing that accreting white doors are really very different than the single ones in the way that they, they cool down uh, so please, if you can put out a plea, um, you can do this with a small telescope um, and you just have to, you know, fold back the data on long stretches and you, you can have that answer. And last, I just want to thank you for all your help with our HST programs uh, because it, it, it allowed us to actually accomplish our HST observations, not only for the creating pulsators, but for all the, the temperatures we have for the white dwarfs that are, that are in CBs over the last 10 years. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Okay. Hi, Paula, this is Elizabeth. We have a few questions here. Okay. Um, and uh, the first one is, is HST the only orbiting instrument that can provide UV observations? Yeah, right now that's pretty much the case. Um, there is going to be a ultraviolet telescope um, that's going up from, let's see, India and Russia. The US is not part of it. I think in a couple years, they've been planning this for many years. But that's the problem, HST is, it's the only one that could take really good spectra at this point. Um, and we're gonna lose, if something happens to HST tomorrow, which it could, because it's an aging you know, an instrument, um, we will lose our UV capability. And we have, um, you know, there's other telescopes that are in the, plan for the future, Louvoir, which is gonna be not until the 2030s. And we have, you know, um, the, the JWST is gonna be mostly infrared. It doesn't do ultraviolet. So we're gonna be in a real hole in terms of getting ultraviolet data. There was Galax, there was Fuse in the past. So we actually, for GW Lee, we did get Galax data close to the outburst. Uh, but that's broadband, it wasn't spectra that we could actually look at the detail and get a really good temperature out from it. So HST has been the, really the, the basic UV capable tape telescope and we're just crossing our fingers that it's going to last longer. Okay, thank you. Um, that, was, that question was from Brad Vici. Um, Gabriel Nigo asks, do you think that uh, the JWST we'll be able to study these objects in more detail. Now, as I said, it's, it's not gonna get into the ultraviolet. So it starts at, JWST starts at I think seven or 8,000 angstroms. So what we, I mean, there's things that we can do. I mean, actually I'm on a, a team that's submitting proposals for NOVI to follow NOVI after offers extra galactic NOVI as well as NOVI in our own galaxy. So it's gonna do a lot in abundances of you know, many CVs. It can also look at, I mean, one of the questions we have is how many CVs have brown dwarf companions? 
And brown dwarfs are so faint and the only really visible in the far, you know, well, for us, for me, the far infrared, but it's really the near infrared. Um, but JWST will be able to do things like that. It's going to be very sensitive since it's a large telescope and hopefully will go up and work. Um, but, you know, it will go after those kinds of things, but we're not, and, you know, we can look at like the cool things. We can look at dust, if there's any dust form, like a novae ejecta, and, and if there's circumbinary dust around, um, normal uh, CVs, but but we're not going to be able to do the ultraviolet. Okay, um, thank you. There's a, a comment that SWIFT can still give us UV photometry. Oh, that's right. SWIFT, SWIFT has the, the um, SWIFT has a UV broadband and also does out an optical. Uh, there's some filters in there. Um, that's a good point. Thank you for mentioning that. The problem with SWIFT is that it only sticks, stays in one spot for like what, 10 minutes. So you mm -hmm. cannot go really deep uh, and you cannot get spectra. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can get um, a value, a, a broadband, which you know is still very helpful. So, and it's, it's better than nothing. It's mm -hmm. just not the spectra that we can do. Okay, thank you. Um, there's just time for one more question. Actually, actually I actually have a three-part question here from Greg Sivikoff. I'm gonna ask you the third part. Could you okay. speculate whether your work could help us understand why some cataclysmic variables may be radio brighter than others? Oh, radio bright. Uh, I think the radio is more associated. I mean, that's the radio is, is so far, that's a different kind of mechanism. And then that's associated mostly with the magnetic systems. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that those are people like Paul Barrett and others are working on the radio and the, um, the far infrared spectra. Uh, so it's, it's really, those kinds of things are seen as maybe jets during outbursts. So I think the work that can be done in the optical is to identify the objects which are doing outbursts so that the radio people can actually look at them at that time and see how many of them are producing the radiation that produces the, uh, the radio. Um, oh, a quick point. Different than, the, than, the, than what happens in a normal CV. Paul, oh, a quick point, there's a context missing from that question and that to the two radio brightest sources are pulsators, uh, UV, uh, AE, aquari uh, Aquarii, and AR oh, I see what you're saying. And that's why I was asking. Well, A Aquarii is not really a pulsator, it's a spin. So the, the, you, the period you see in that is the spin of the white dwarf, oh. which is different than the pulsator. Um, and actually, you know, in uh, unrelated work to this, but we're, we think we have another A Aquarii. I, Peter, I'm working with Peter Garnovich. Uh, there may be another a, a Aquarii type coming out, but those are different. Those are magnetic propellers. So um, yeah, the radio is usually associated with some kind of uh, synchrotron or something associated with a jet or with a, a magnetic propeller type thing. Those are very interesting systems. You know, those are, you know, diff completely different from what I was talking pulsators, but it's, you know, it's very, very interesting um, work that's coming out of the radio, I think. You should have Paul Barrett come give a talk. <laughs> We'll definitely consider it. Thank you so much, Paula. So up next, we have Aaron Shaw on measuring the masses of white doors with x-rays, a new star legacy survey. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just share my screen. OK. That's the phrase of 2020, isn't it? Let me just share my screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Shaw. I'm a postdoc at the University of Nevada in Reno. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, how we might measure masses of white dwarfs using x rays. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on a survey um, that me and some colleagues listed here initiated with a new star x ray telescope. So let's start right at the beginning. Uh, cataclysmic variables, we've just had an excellent talk about a particular class of CVs. Uh, the basic setup is you have a white dwarf, which is the um, remnants of a, a dead star, look much like what will be left behind when our own sun dies. Uh, it is accreting matter from a companion star or a donor via this disk of material, which we, we call the accretion disk. And CVs are of great interest to the astronomical community. Uh, they show lots of interesting uh, variability. So such as, for example, on the left figure here, we see a light curve, the historical light curve of the famous CV SS-SIG, which shows lots of these um, dwarf nova outbursts, which are characterized by a, 
a rapid increase in brightness and then a just as rapid uh, decrease back to a quiescent level. Um, they also show, some, some CVs show what we call nova explosions. So this is when a shell of material uh, builds up around the white dwarf uh, and is ignited. Uh, and we see again, a huge increase in brightness before a slow return to its quiescent level. But um, they're not just, you know, they don't just show interesting behavior. They're also uh, of cosmic importance. Um, <clears throat> why, why do we care about CVs? Well, white dwarfs are the progenitors of what we call type 1A supernovae. So type 1A supernovae are just uh, one of the avenues star can go down to end its life. Uh, these happen when a white dwarf reaches a critical mass, which we call the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, and it cannot hold itself together anymore. It has to explode. Um, and these are very, very good cosmic distance indicators. And knowing distances to things like galaxies is key in um, is a key aspect of the science of cosmology, uh, the branch of astrophysics which studies the universe. So it could be uh, a case could be made that understanding type one A supernovae and therefore understanding white dwarfs can go a long way to helping us understand the universe itself. <laughs> So I'm gonna change tack a little bit and talk about a particular subclass of um, CVs, which we call magnetic CVs, or in my case, I'm gonna talk about intermediate polars. So this is another artist's impression here. And we have a very similar setup. We have a white dwarf, which is accreting matter from a sun-like star, um, except the white dwarf in this case is extremely magnetic. We're talking millions of times uh, the magnetic field of say the earth. And what this does is it, it kind of um, <clears throat> disrupts the innermost regions of the accretion disk and you get this kind of donut shape. And instead the matter is forced to flow along the magnetic field lines onto the poles of the white dwarf. <clears throat> um, MCVs or IPs as I'm gonna call them are regularly observed by the AAVSO community because they're extremely bright optical sources, easily accessible with one to two meter class telescopes or even smaller. And they show all sorts of interesting variability, much like the non-magnetic CVs I, I talked about earlier. Uh, here are a couple of light curves put together with uh, 16 years, around 16 years of regular monitoring by the AAVSO community. These light curves were put together by my student, Ava Covington. And you can just, you can kind of see um, a few of the different types of variability we see in these sources. For example, DW Cancri on the left, um, is showing spin variability, uh, it's showing variability on its orbital period, it's also showing a drop to what we call a low state. Um, on the right, Diodraconis might have shown a dwarf nova there at around uh, 4000 on the x-axis. So you can see why they'd be um, interesting sources to monitor regularly. Um, but they're not just very bright optical sources, they're also extremely bright x-ray sources. And this is where I'm gonna get into the kind of the meat of my um, talk here. Uh, this is a little cartoon here, um, which shows where the matter flowing from the companion along the magnetic field lines onto the surface of the white dwarf. And it falls at free fall velocity. So the velocity is for, informed entirely by the gravity of the white dwarf, i.e. its mass and radius. Um, and when it reaches the surface of the white dwarf, it exceeds the sound speed in that medium and, and causes a shock. And the temperature of that shock is informed directly by the velocity at which the material falls onto the white dwarf. And as I just said, the velocity is informed directly by that equation there in the top left, the mass and radius of the white dwarf. So theoretically, if we could somehow measure the temperature of the shock, then we might be able to measure the mass of the white dwarf. We have a direct relation between the two. Now the trouble here is that the shocks reach um, tens of kilo electron volts, which is the is how the temperature X-ray astronomy, and these temperatures can only be probed by hard X-ray telescopes. So this is where New Star comes in. This is the one in the top right, the little telescope there, which can focus hard X-rays. It's the only telescope that is able to focus X-rays be, uh, beyond that 10 kV uh, limit. So this is why it's very useful for studying IPs. <clears throat> uh, this also um, is a separate way to measure masses of white dwarfs to the normal method we use, which is the 
radial velocity method. Uh, and the radial velocity method uses optical spectra and is often unreliable because it requires a, um, a good knowledge of the inclination, which is often hard to find. So this provides an independent method of measuring masses. Why do we care about the masses of white dwarfs? Well, if we look at this plot here, which shows the mass distributions of white dwarfs, a, diff a few different flavors of white dwarfs, um, we can see in the top panel that the non-magnetic CVs have a mass distribution that peaks at around 0.7 to 0.8 uh, solar masses. But, but if we look at what we consider to be the precursors of the current population of CVs, uh, those are the co post-common envelope binaries, as we call them, those seem to peak at much lower masses. Uh, and this follows for isolated white dwarfs as well, which we find also peak at around 0.5 to 0.6 solar masses. Um, so there seems to be some fundamental difference between the, non, uh, between the accreting white dwarfs and the non-accreting white dwarfs, whether they're in binaries or not. Uh, does this follow for magnetic white dwarfs in uh, IPs, uh, magnetic CVs? Um, so we initiated the survey of around two dozen magnetic CVs with New Star with the idea that we can measure the temperature of these and therefore form a mass distribution. So <clears throat> here are the results here. Um, and we can see again that the average mass of the white dwarfs in magnetic CVs are around point, uh, peak at around 0.7 to 0.8 solar masses. The average mass is, is about 0.77 solar masses, which is pretty much the same as the non-magnetic CVs. Um, we can take a closer look here. The top two panels of these figures are exactly the same. So what I'm showing here is in gray, we see the non-magnetic CVs, uh, the, the white dwarfs in non-magnetic CVs. And then in, in the hatched marks, uh, we can see the histogram of the magnetic CVs. And you can see that they peak at basically the same um, mass, 0.7 to 0.8 solar masses. Whereas if we look on the, the bottom two panels, the bottom left shows that um, pre-CV, that the precursor to CV mass distribution. Um, and we can see that those peak at lower masses, 0.5 to 0.6. And it's similar with the isolated white dwarfs. Now, these are on the same scale, so you could um, <clears throat> see the differences quite easily. And so again, that shows you that there's some kind of fundamental difference between the white dwarfs in accre accreting systems versus those that are not in accreting systems, whether they're isolated or haven't started that accretion process just yet. Um, and that might seem like it makes complete sense because the accreting white dwarfs are doing exactly that. They're accreting. So they're gathering mass from the, um, their companion stars and dumping it onto the surface of the white dwarf. So surely that means that's okay. They can just grow in mass. Well, that seems like it makes sense, but remember a few slides back, I talked about Nova explosions. Um, and the idea here is that, um, accreting white dwarfs are, are, are not supposed to keep that matter. They're, they're supposed to blow it off in a Nova explosion. When it reaches a critical, sh like the shell of material reaches a critical mass, it's supposed to blow away in one of these Nova explosions. But there's increasing evidence that um, there is that di difference between the non-accreting and the uh, accreting white dwarfs in CVs um, that suggests that maybe there are holes in our current theory of uh, NOVA and accretion. So where does this leave us at the moment? Um, so hopefully I've convinced you all that uh, the, uh, our new star legacy survey of magnetic CVs has, has shown that we have an average mass of 0.77 solar masses in, in these magnetic uh, cataclysmic variables, which lines up with the um, masses of white dwarfs in non, uh, sorry, masses of white dwarfs in non-magnetic CVs um, suggesting that accreting white dwarfs are more massive than isolated and non-accreting ones. Why is this? Well, that is the open question. Uh, I mentioned, I alluded to earlier, that perhaps our theories of novae and accretion, or the cycle between those two um, aspects of a CV, could require some work. It might have some gaps. Another leading theory is that perhaps these lower mass white dwarfs do exist in CVs, but they're hidden somehow, so we're not detecting them. Uh, this could be that the accretion phase is unstable, so they switch off and we don't see them. 
as X-ray sources uh, or for bright optical sources. But these, uh, these are open questions um, that we just don't know the answer to yet. And I think that uh, is a perfect uh, place to leave it. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions for Aaron? Uh, um, yes, how do we know the mass, from Nancy Morrison, how do we know the masses of isolated white dwarfs? That's a great question. Um, so one of the most common ways to do that is through spectra. If we measure the temperature of the white dwarf, as was alluded to um, earlier in, in, in Paula's talk, you can measure the spectra of white dwarfs quite easily, um, measure the temperature of white dwarfs quite easily with the spectra, and that temperature links to their mass. Um, so that's how, the, 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 that's how we measure the masses of isolated white dwarfs. Thank you. And uh, Joyce Guzik asks, does the temperature of the shock depend also on the mass of the infalling material, the accretion rate, as well as the velocity? And if so, do you know the accretion rate well? That's another great question. Um, no, it doesn't. It depends. It just depends entirely on how fast it falls. It falls quite constantly. Um, we don't know the accretion rates too well. Um, we can make educated guesses, but it only matters how fast it is falling, um, which is um, quite astounding, really, that we can turn that into a mass, which is why I find this so interesting. Uh, Firad Kingi asks, how can a white dwarf be magnetic? Is it common? Um, I guess the origin of magnetic fields is a very open question, not just in uh, sources like this, but in it's across astrophysics, cosmic magnetic fields. Magnetism seems to be pretty common across uh, the cosmos, but we're not so sure on how it gets there, if that makes sense. So magnetic CVs are fairly common, not as common as non-magnetic ones. Um, we know of quite a few, but we, the, uh, how, that mag how that white dwarf came to be so magnetic is still an open question. Um, there, are some theories that um, the, the magnetic field develops when, as the, the binary is being formed in what we call the common envelope phase, but it's hard to test and we just don't know the answer. And finally, how can the, Greg Sivakov asks, how can the AAVSO help you in your work? Hi, Greg, nice to, nice to see you. Um, how can the AAVSO help? Well, they, um, <clears throat> I showed a couple of those light curves earlier that my student threw together. Uh, it, with regard to uh, this particular project, um, sorry, with regard to magnetic CVs, the AAVSO already have helped. Um, they, the, the regular monitoring actually shows us, you know, the crazy variability that we're seeing. Uh, for example, those low states that I showed is something that is not particularly well understood. Um, and uh, I'm currently working with my student in um, monitoring these low states using AAVSO data so we can trigger X-ray programs. So that's, uh, that's a, a separate project, but the AAVSO is already helping. So um, thank you. So we should just keep on doing what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just keep going um, and uh, keep, keep putting that data up because it's incredible. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Aaron. So next Thank up, you. we have Gregory Sivakov on the quick and the dead time. All right. I'll ask the number one question of uh, Zoom. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure today to talk to you guys about the quick and the dead. Oh, wait a minute, no, this is not a Western uh, conference. This is an astronomy conference. So instead, the quick and the dead that I'm going to be talking about today are actually systems involving stellar mass black holes. And what you're seeing here 
is a real time artistic rendition of what went on in one source. And you can see bright X-ray flashes towards the base of an accretion disk around a black hole. And you see a jet of material coming out and you see those flashes being slightly delayed from the X-ray emission. And this is, as I said, real time behavior sort of that you're seeing here. So these things are very quick. And of course, since they're black holes, they're dead. But if you notice, the title of my talk is not the quick and the dead, it's the quick and the dead time. And the reason why is because in order to make these type of observations, you need to have an instrument that's capable of looking at very rapid variability. So here we see a light curve on one date where we just zoom in on different pieces of information on different time scales from you know, hundreds of seconds to tens of seconds down to single seconds. And you can see that there's exquisite amount of structure in here. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Before I begin, I'm talking to you from Edmonton, Alberta. And since we're all gathering virtually, I want to take the time to remind us all that a lot of astronomy occurs on uh, lands that were originally held by various indigenous peoples. For instance, I'm performing my research from the Treaty 6 uh, territory in Canada. And this basically was a traditional gathering place for many different indigenous peoples. And that just as we're gathering remotely from many places, I wanted to remind us of all that, especially given where we are in today's culture. I also want to thank my team. So most of this work has been led by my former PhD student, Alex Tedarenko, who is now at uh, the James Clark Max Tele Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. Um, but it's an international team. Four different uh, countries are represented, uh, two of my former students. And this is really sort of groundbreaking work. So recently, we found out that you can make exquisite images of black holes. This is an image from the supermassive black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy. The Event Horizon Telescope's world famous view of the shadow of a black hole. And this has exquisite angular resolution. This is, the angular resolution is about 25 micro arc seconds. And that's the equivalent of being able to separate two hairs next to one another at 200 kilometers. And it'd be great if we could do the type of detailed imaging that the EHT does all over astronomy, but we can't. So what else can we do? Well, I'd like you guys to think about how fast light travels. So I'm showing here a not to scale image of our solar system. And of course, by definition, we're one astronomical unit away from the sun. And it takes light about 500 seconds to travel from the sun to the earth. That's just a, a period of time we'll call all 500 light seconds. If we go from the earth to the moon, we're now at 1.3 light seconds. And if we take EHT's resolution, the little circle in the lower right, we'd be able to see the separation between the Earth and the Moon at distances less than 320 light years. That's the distance light travels in 320 years, which seems absolutely incredible, except when you realize that even the center of our galaxy is about 25,000 light years, let alone extragalactic sources. So instead of using imaging, you can actually use timing to get at very small scales. And one of the best advantages of this is as you go further and further away in the universe, two things occur. Your sources get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer by the distance squared, but the resolving power you goes, get goes down by the, dis uh, by the distance. So things get really hard to image fast with distance. With timing, you're still affected by the distance squared fading of sources, but time is time all over the universe, barring relativistic effects. And that enables us to actually do this type of timing across the entire universe if your source is bright enough. So we talked about 50 micro arc seconds, and I talked about the fact that we're looking at stellar mass black holes. So what exactly are we looking at? This is a picture of an X-ray binary. This particular X-ray binary is great because the separation at the, the uh, distance that this source is at, which is about uh, 9,000, 10,000 light years, the separation between the central object at the center of that disk, which is a black hole in this case, and the donor star that is putting material onto a creation disk 
is the resolution element of the HT, 25 micro arc seconds. So you might say, great, we can put the HT on this. Well, it's harder than that. Maybe one day we'll be able to do that. But this is the type of system we're looking at. That 25 micro arc seconds, which seems really hard to do, is a whopping 40 light seconds. Now that doesn't seem like much, but there's an incredible amount of stuff that you can do. Now, let's take in point the classical discovery of a stellar mass black hole, the X-ray binary system called Cygnus X1. Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Let's take into account this particular system. We actually were able to understand what's going on in this system by looking at the variability in the system. On the left, we have a radial velocity curve. This is showing how fast the star's light is moving towards us and away from us, towards us and away from us. On the right, we have a light curve where this is showing how bright the star is. And because it turns out that the, uh, the star is slightly oddly shaped, you see the same type of variability. This is folded on the period that we know. That period is 2.62157 days. Yes, you know periods to exquisite uh, scales. That's 226,000 seconds. So that means that we can already learn a lot by looking at relatively long time scales in these systems. So what can you do when you consider the fact that it's 40 light seconds? Well, before we go and actually see that, let's think about these systems for a second. The relativistic jet that you see coming out from the accretion disk is bright at the radio to the near infrared, maybe extending into the optical emission. The disk around the black hole or neutron star in the X-ray binary, well, that's very bright at X-rays in the inner part. And as you go to the outer parts of the accretion disk, you start going to ultraviolet and optical light. And of course, the donor stars tend to be bright in the optical to UV. So if we're going to study the jets, we're interested in the radio to the near infrared and maybe the optical. If we're going to study the accretion disk, we're definitely interested in the X-ray and maybe in the ultraviolet and optical. And unfortunately, to many of us, that donor star is just noise. Well, what can you do when one of these systems accretion disk around, suddenly gets unstable and starts dumping matter onto the black hole. Well, you get an outburst. And what's shown here is a light curve of another black hole X-ray binary, uh, what X-ray astronomers call maxi J1820 plus 070, what many other astronomers call assassin-18EY. And this is an X-ray binary where we now know there's an approximately eight solar mass black hole at the center of that uh, system. And this is the light curve from AAVSO. For those of you who are not used to looking at light curves, the weird axis on the left side magnitudes, yes, that is backwards. The smaller magnitude is, the brighter an object is. And it's also weirdly logarithmic, which is sort of like the way your eyes see. But so it's not that this star goes from uh, sort of a factor of 10% or 50% variability. No, instead, this star shows factors of 1,000 variability. This particular light curve is taken in the V band and the optical. And you can see the source undergoes lots of, uh, goes, undergoes a major outburst when we first discovered it, and then some reflares. Well, I'm talking about rapid variability, so we need to zoom in a little bit more. So let's zoom in at this period. But even this type of zoom in, we're seeing the activity on days is not enough. So let's zoom in some more. And this is now a time scale of hours. And this is still the V-band light curve. And if you're not careful, you might go, oh, we don't have a lot of data here. But remember, AAVSO observers observe in different filters. Now, the two uh, people that are observing here are Josh Helms and Barbara Harris's data on the left and the right. Josh also observes an I-band. And it turns out that Michael Richmond observed in an unfiltered version of V-band throughout the observation. So we actually have a fair bit of data here. And this data needs to be put in the context of what we did in our program, which is studying the rapid radio variability, mainly in the submillimeter and the radio. But we need to put this in the context of what's going on in the X-ray, in the optical, in the near infrared. And so this is a paper in preparation. And you can see that there's variability all over the place. The wide uh, width in the X-ray, the optical, and uh, the near infrared, that's not errors. That's showing how variable the source actually is. 
you can see that as we go down in frequency, up in wavelength, the variability becomes easier to see. It gets washed out and also gets to be less prominent. Nevertheless, you can see that there's still lots of structure. So what can you do with that structure? Well, let's take the VLA observations at 12 millimeters and the VLA observations at 27 millimeters, and let's compare them. By the way, the AVSO data is in this part of the uh, of our light curve. So Barbara, Jos, Michael will be in touch. So what do we see? Well, here I'm showing you the light curve as we see it. And you'll notice that hopefully that there's a similar structure between the 12 millimeter and the 27 millimeter band intensities. Well, what you could do is you can start shifting that first by a minute, two minutes, and so forth, until you get to five minutes. And wow, that looks to be a pretty good match. Now, this technique of shifting, we don't do by eyes. Well, actually, we do at first. But eventually, we do this via an actual uh, a medical technique called cross correlation. And when we do this cross correlation, at the center right of this uh, plot, you'll see a peak that gets above the red 99% line. That line is where we start believing there might be actual variability on the time scales. And you can see that that lag is not entirely at zero, it's a little bit offset. And it tells us that the 27 millimeter data lags the 12 millimeter data by about five minutes. All right, so what? Well, this is what may be going on. This is our picture of a jet. The different colors here are roughly showing us where in this jet the different bands of emission are coming from because there are weird effects that means that the longest wavelength emission does not tend to come from the same place that the shortest wavelength emission does in the jet. So let's say at some time we have a flare. We're going to call this T ejecta. You can call this T0. Well, what's going to happen is information flows outwards. So a little bit later, you start getting different delays to different bands. And you can look at those bands and you go, all right, I can figure out the delay. Now, the problem is you may not know when the ejecta time scale actually is. But what you can do is you can compare two different uh, time scales and actually get at what the intrinsic time scale is by looking at their difference. And that was that five minutes that we saw. So what happens when you do this? Well, first off, you learn about the speed of the jet. And second, because we've gotten really good at some uh, detailed models, we can actually start getting other properties. So what's actually going on, we think? This, the fluid in this jet is moving at nearly the speed of light, between 95 and 98%. And this actually is the fastest jet we've ever measured in a black hole X-ray binary. That's cool. But we start bringing in our other uh, models. And the first thing we note is that the jet geometry is not consistent with the classical model. That conical shape I showed you is probably slightly incorrect. Maybe it's a paraboloid. Maybe it's something else. We still need to work on that. The other thing we can do is we can actually measure just how thick the jet is. And I showed you a very exaggerated jet in the previous slides. This is the actual jet. It is highly confined. The total opening angle from the top to the bottom would only be about one degree. And the other thing we can do is we can measure just how much power is in the kinetic jet energy in this jet. And it's 600 trillion trillion watts, which is a lot, although that's only 6% of the X-ray luminosity. But we can actually start measuring how much, jet is in these, uh, how much power is in these jets and maybe start understanding how they might affect their environments. Now, really quickly, what can you do with, uh, with the AAVSO? Well, it turns out that uh, we can look at other times. And other observations look at multiple instruments, and we see their variability. Now, all in told, this is great, because we can get multiple observations all at the same time. We can produce cross-correlation analyses. And those analyses tell us Maybe we see some optical emission from the outer disk, a weird anti-correlation that we still have to explain. And then we see a slight delay from the jet base. 
which is probing something that is the size of eight times the Earth's radius. And this is what we need in order to go to those sub-second cadences. Now, the uh, UltraCam instrument has dichroic beam splitters that allow simultaneous multiple filter observations. But what we do is we observe just a small window on the source and one of the comparison star in order to have rapid readout with little dead time. So the UltraCam uses a standard frame transfer uh, CCD, and it can reach frame rates of 400 hertz. And if you address for inflation and convert to US dollars, that costs 640,000. The newer HyperCam instrument costs 4.4 million, but has five simultaneous bands and can get to a kilohertz. Now, I'm not suggesting you need those instruments. As a matter of fact, you could get a simple CMOS chip and you could actually reach a kilohertz in one band for about six to $8,000. However, I'll be honest, you may not have enough light coming from your object, so you don't even need to do the windows. You can get your full frame in some of these CMOSes at 30 hertz, 30 observations per second for six to 8,000. And by going to lower wavelengths, it's highly quantum efficient and has low read noise. So just make sure to pick your bright targets when you do this. So I wanna end by saying that we see rapid variability allows us to probe behaviors that we can never actually make detailed images of. The radio through near infrared and even optical observations actually allow us to measure the properties of jets that are escaping from outside black holes at nearly the speed of light. And with the CMOS chip, you can join the fun in the ranks of the quick and the low dead time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, let's see, we're out of time for questions. And so right now our next presentation is going to be by Dr. Q on CMOS and CCD cameras. He is with QHY CCD, one of our platinum annual meeting and workshop sponsors. And so if you're looking for any information on this topic, um, you can go here. And as is very common to say, I am going to share my screen. Uh, 
using the basic camera is a very short for for the metric uh, using. <coughs> there is uh, only four models on this uh, servers. Pressure uh, 600, pressure uh, 200, 16, 16H, pressure uh, 411, and pressure 461. I think the most important sense of for the metric is the image of the sensor. So we did some tests of, for these cameras. And this is this the this curve with the pressure 600. Uh, let us say it has a very large a linear uh, range from up to 16 5 uh, 16 5 k uh, in this and i also test uh, we will also test another model which we have four in and this is the test of the results and this result is also very good to show the good uh, performance of the linear of these cameras. And uh, the full view of this camera is very uh, good. Even for the 16, uh, uh, even for 6. Uh, uh, 74 uh, microns, uh, the chisel is not very big. But uh, even for this small users, it has very large uh, for wheel. Uh, for 600, we have measured uh, about uh, 16 k uh, in advance. And for read on this, uh, this camera is uh, also very good. Uh, it is uh, in high beam, you can get uh, about one in uh, read on OS. And uh, in noise, uh, it can get 3.5 uh, in a uh, And for the very big four wheel, uh, the uh, 18 k four wheel, it can get uh, 6 uh, in a uh, The most popular camera of this series is the uh, QHS 600. This camera is four formats. Uh, we we get this camera about last year, uh, the October, we, we have sent the first cameras uh, to the market. And it is 16 bit, uh, 16 meter sensors, uh, 13 meters sensors. Uh, and also, this camera is zero and single problem. So, even you make every number of square times. Six hundred uh, seconds. Uh, you can now see any complete uh, problem on the image. And also, they have they have no API. Uh, so it is very good. Uh, we we did a special uh, timing to clear the 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 between uh, frames. So it has no API limits. The upcoming. <coughs> Pressure 268. Uh, this summary is HSC uh, format. It should be cheaper than question 600. The question 600 is about uh, 4,000 donors to 5,000 donors. And uh, the professional version is 8,000 donors. And this question 268 uh, is uh, uh, maybe a, a more than two. Uh, in this uh, design, we have a very special design for the to get uh, every big for you. Uh, this technology is uh, we have the uh, this is a unique technology. Uh, we have uh, like we have uh, in Sony state to get it is uh, only fifteen k uh, fifteen k uh, for you. I got the uh, upper can get uh, eight, 18k for it. Uh, for question 600, we can supply different uh, models and they should have focus version. You can get uh, about seven millimeters uh, per focus. And also, we have to supply the water cooling and customer version. 
to reduce the defense uh, the resolution and the, for the particular problems to reduce uh, efficiency, especially for the uh, IS systems. This is some less future so uh, our user uh, use projects and just Okay, this is uh, uh, the the I want to promotion. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, I would like to start the uh, SEO uh, conference uh, in this year. So there you have from QHYCCD. Next up is Tom Richards. And he'll be talking about researching eclipsing binaries down under, illustrating the methods and results of the variable stars south. His presentation yes. is coming right up. Hi, Stella. He's actually not online, so um, I think we can uh, choose to shuffle around our schedule a little. Yes, of course. Okay, so next up is Philip Romanov. So Philip, I'm gonna give you a couple moments to get ready. And Philip will be discussing discoveries of variable stars by amateur astronomers using data mining on the example of eclipsing binary Romanov V20. Mm -hmm. Hello, attendees of the 100 nights AAVSO annual meeting. My name is Filip Amanov, and title of my presentation is Discoveries of Variable Stars by Amateur Astronomers 
using data mining on the example of eclipsing binary Ramanov V20. The background of the first slide is a photo of the night sky over the sea of Japan and the lighthouse. I took this photo in my small homeland near Yuzhna Moskoy, Primorsky High, Russia. Second slide about me. I'm 23 years old. I have been an amateur astronomer for over 11 years based on self-education. I am a member of the AAVSO. I want and I plan to go to university to study astronomy. The first variable star discovered by me was registered in the International Variable Star Index almost five years ago. I found its variability using the data mining in the photometric data of the Northern Sky Variability Survey. Besides 71 variable stars, I am the discoverer of planetary nebulae candidates, astronomical transients, and possible double stars. Third slide. These are the types of variable stars discovered by me. Uh, at first, I searched for only semi-regular variable stars. But when I gained experience, I began to find variables of other types, including eclipsing variables and cataclysmic. Some of them I discovered by the method of blinking digitized photographic plates, but most are discovered by the method of data mining. On the example of an eclipsing variable of the algal type Romanov V20, I will tell you how to search for variable stars with this method. On the fourth slide, you can see uh, information about this variable star. This was registered in the VS6 under the name of Romanov V20. Romanov is my last name. V is an abbreviation for the word variable. 20 is the original number of stars in the V6 with this designation. The star is located in the southern celestial hemisphere. Uh, the fifth slide uh, shows the data of the star from the Vizier catalogs and from the AAVSO photometric or sky survey a pass. As you can see, the star outside of eclipses is bright enough to be photographed with amateur telescopes. Estimated distance to the star is 6034 light years. Next slide, uh, how I choose the star from many others to search for variability. I uh, used uh, TAP Vizier service. I wrote the code in the astronomical data query language. You can see it in the screenshot in which I requested data from the Allwise catalog from a specific area of the sky and with certain uh, colors and magnitudes of the stars. In order to exclude possible uh, Myra type variables from the search uh, results. On the next slide, you can see the search results. I uh, see select the stars with values in the VAR 
uh, column with nine and nine in the first two of four bands. VAR is variability flag in the vice uh, source uh, records. It shows a uh, measure of probability that the source is variable in that band. I choose the highest values and copy the coordinates of the stars. But uh, this does not mean for uh, sure that they are real variables. If they were not published in the catalogs uh, of variable stars, this must be checked uh, manually. Uh, the next slide uh, show a screenshot of the uh, Vizier service. Uh, it is necessary to check by the coordinates of the selected stars uh, whether their variability was known earlier in different astronomical catalogs. It also need to check it uh, in the uh, Simbad service. This is not much different. After checking one of the stars for the absence of uh, the previously known variability at the given coordinates, I requested photometric data from the sky survey ASASSN. Uh, on the 10th slide, you can see the light curve of the selected star from the data of this survey which were opened in the VSTAR software. It is immediately uh, clear here that is an eclipsing variable. This slide shows how I was looking for a peri period in the software VSTAR. Uh, first, I found an approximate period in this and then improved at it according to the shape of the face plot. At first, I checked uh, a range from zero to 10 days uh, when uh, searching for a period. And at the end, I already checked periods from one to two days. As you can see, a very clear period uh, has been found. The next slide shows the phase plot for the selected period and for a specific uh, epoch. From this data, I determined uh, the amplitude of the eclipses and the duration of the primary eclipse. As you can see from the light curve, this is a large amplitude eclipsing variable. During the primary eclipse, the magnitude uh, decreases by almost three units. Next, I uh, checked the photometric data for the star from other sky surveys. Part of all primary eclipse duration was recorded in the super wasp data. In the ASAS3 data, the eclipse is clearly visible as a gap in the face plot. In the FAS epoch photometry data, the eclipse was recorded in different bands. Finally, in the data of Neowise Air, was eclipses were recorded very well. In the phase plot, you can see different duration of the eclipses and amplitude uh, ratio because of infrared bands. 
To register a variable star in the AAVSO V6, Discover must have an account. This is a different from the account of the main AAVSO website. In the form of submit of a new variable star, it is necessary to fill in the fields with the information, uh, data from catalogs, the found values of the period, amplitude and duration of the eclipse, uh, face plot and uh, the source of information. If discover had incorrect data, then the VS6 administration will inform discover about this for correction. And when everything is correct, the star will be registered. Next, it needs to get a star chart with the variable star plotter using AAVSO unique ID identifier, identifier of variable star. If there are no comparison uh, reference stars, then it needs to request them from the AAVSO. After adding the comparison stars, I uh, observed the primary eclipse of the star using a remote telescope of iTelescope net in Australia. I calculated the time of minima using the ephemeris of the web page in the VS6, but weather conditions and other circumstances allowed me to record only part of all primary eclipse duration. For photometric uh, uh, measures, I used uh, Maxim DL Pro uh, version 6.23 demo software and AAVSO star chart. In the end, I combined the data from, uh, from several sky service uh, with my uh, photometric observations and I improved the data on amplitudes of eclipses the epoch period and duration of primary eclipse. On this slide, uh, I wrote sources of information, references. On this slide, you can see my contacts. Uh, this is my first experience of speaking in English. I had no practice in spoken English, so I'm ready to answer your questions only in writing. At the end of my presentation, on the last slide, thank you for your attention. There is my landscape photo on the coast of the Sea of Japan, a uh, star seen. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. That was wonderful. Um, we we don't have questions for you right now, but I do have some comments for you from people. Um, Bob Buckheim says, Philip, this is a wonderful project. Congratulations. And Sebastian Otero, who you know from VSX, <laughs> says, Philip, Congratulations for your impressive work. We'll be waiting for Romanov, Romanov V100. Your findings show that large amplitude variables can still be discovered by amateur observers using publicly available data. And I'd like to add my own congratulations to you as well. Thank, and thank you. All right, thank you, Philip. So 
I have heard from Tom that he is unable, unfortunately, to be with us virtually, but I have his presentation and I'll be playing it for you. So Tom Richards' presentation is on researching eclipsing binaries down under, illustrating the methods and results of variable stars south. I am working on sharing my screen. Good day. Hey, my name is Tom Richards. I want to talk to you today about a big problem that us observers of variable stars have in the Southern Hemisphere and how Variable Stars South was set up to deal with it. Our problem here is this, isolation. There may be no more than a few dozen observers uh, south of the line, and so isolation is a big problem. Yes, we do, of course, contribute to the AOVSO International Database, but beyond that, carrying out collaborative work and helping each other is extremely difficult. In Victoria, there are three other active observers that I know of, and it would be a day's journey for me to visit any of them. So what's the solution? Variable Star South was set up to provide solutions, and I will describe one of them. In the Southern Eclipsing Binaries Research Group of Variable Star South, we, of course, contribute our date magnitude observations to the AAVSO International Database. But we also work in the cloud where we collaborate in five further steps of research. First, we derive minima estimates. Secondly, we compare our minima with predictions. Thirdly, we find better ephemerides that is to say a period and one epoch of minimum. We detect period change and of course then we write it all up. I'll describe one tool in the cloud that everyone uses and most effectively the minima analysis form. Welcome to a minima analysis form. Let me spend a moment to show you how it works. Beforehand, of course, the observer has to find the eclipse minimum in their observed light curve. There's lots of good software for doing that and eye estimates are not welcome. Then going to the minima analysis form for their particular binary, they enter the minimum value and its error in the orange section on the left. Then things happen behind the scenes. Up on the right is a box of one or more ephemerides or light elements. From the top one, a calculation is made behind the scenes and it derives the O minus C value for the new minimum and enters it in the gray area. Then still on the right, the light element calculator calculates a new ephemeris from all the minima entries and the current ephemeris and enters it in the light element box. Finally, the new minimum is added to the O minus C diagram on the right. And the best fit regression line is displayed. Its equation is, of course, the new light elements just calculated by the light element calculator. Well, that gives the observer, who's just turned into an analyst, a wealth of data to explore and manipulate. It also makes it easy to collate all the group's work on all target binaries in a year, as you'll see later.
The minima analysis forms make it easy for us to collect all our data for the year together and publish in an annual results paper, which we've been doing for some years. First, of course, these include the minima timings, often usually more than 100 of them. And next, um, where we've got enough data over the years, we publish new light elements from our minima. And finally, we publish O minus C diagrams of those ones with new ephemerides. Often as here, they indicate a more complex period that cannot be adequately described by the uh, linear light elements. Here's a story of a major clash with published data and how the minima analysis form allowed us to sort it all out. V883 Scorpii was first studied by Stromeyer and Nig using plates from Sonnenberg and Mount John observatories. Their results are quoted in the GCVS and in VSX notably with a period of somewhat over a day. A few years ago, Neil Butterworth obtained six minima of this star uh, spanning three seasons. On analysis of Neil's data, it looked as if the period was quite different, over three times as long. So who was right? We checked the ASAS-3 photometry for the star and tried folding it on the discovery period. That made a mess. So then we folded the ASAS-3 data on Neil's period and we got a clean result. Moreover, the star was plainly an EA and not an EB and it has an elliptical orbit because the secondary minimum is offset. That's half the detective story. The other half of the story is to find out how Stromeyer and Nig got it so wrong. To find out what went wrong, we added all the Stromeyer NIG minima data to the minima analysis form. There's some of it and there's more of it. We also took the ASAS-3 photometry and with a bit of programming trickery extracted some minima times from it. Then we did the same for integral OMC photometry. All those minima we added to the minima analysis form, which then calculated the O minus Cs. The results, well, let's look at the O minus C diagram. Here's the O minus C diagrams from our minima analysis form as based on Stromeyer and Nig's ephemeris on the left and our ephemeris on the right. Looking at the O minus Cs according to Stromeyer and Nig first, their minima occur on the left. The points that they say are primary minima are black at O minus C equals zero, as they should be. The big black square, incidentally, is a single visual estimate by detail. That's a creditable effort. The points that Stromeyer and Nick say are secondary are the minima in red around O minus C equals 0.6 days, consistent with the 1.2 day period. But note, three of their claimed secondaries are at O minus C equals zero, which is worrying. Worse, all the other minima data since, Niels, ASAS3 and OMC are all over the place, which is rather a mess, really. 
When we plugged our ephemeris into the active row of the light elements table in the minima analysis form, you could watch the O minus C rearrange itself like a movie. The result in the right hand panel is undeniably neat. All the recent data line up in two rows. For primary minima in black and secondary minima in red. Looking at the Stromeyer NIG data in the left of this panel, we can see that they mistook some primary minima for secondaries and vice versa. And that explains where they went wrong. But this O minus C diagram suggests other possibilities for future investigation. All the recent secondaries have a notably different O minus C from the discovery secondaries, yet they are perfectly level and so are the primaries. That suggests the elliptical orbit may be precessing slowly, but you can't tell without some intervening data. Maybe there's a light time effect from a third body. We just can't tell. There aren't enough data. Also, the discovery minima are a bit scattered, up to a quarter of a day, which seems large. It's impossible to speculate why. But to round off our discussion of Southern Hemisphere research, this O minus C diagram is showing once again the problem we face. With few observers, the data are too sparse over time to support any testable hypothesis about the period behavior of this, or indeed just about any system. And in this case, if we hadn't got that ASAS3 and OMC data, we would be even more in the dark. All we can do is keep collecting minima on our chosen targets, and maybe a picture will come into focus. No instant gratification in this game. Well, that's all folks. I hope I've shown you a way of working down south that brings scattered observers together to collaborate in observing, but also to collaborate in analyzing their results. The way of doing it that I illustrated was to provide record forms that anyone could add to and then explore and analyze using built-in tools. It works well. Thank you for your attention. All right. And as you said, you can feel free to email him, Tom. Um, let's see, I think his email is uh, tomprettyhill at gmail.com. Um, I know we haven't had time for all everyone's questions to be answered. So at the end of our presentations, um, everyone's Q&A are um, available to me and then I can always send them off to the presenters. Um, next up before our sessions, we have one more presenter, uh, Matthew Note, and he will be presenting on characterizing the O'Connell effect in Kepler eclipsing binaries. Okay, can you see and hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, all right, so let me get this. Okay, and is everyone seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Matthew Note, uh, and today I'll be talking about my efforts to characterize eclipsing binaries observed by the Kepler spacecraft that show the O'Connell effect. 
I'll largely be speaking about this project and its results, which forms the basis of my PhD dissertation. But I'll also be giving uh, some ways that I think that the AAVSO can contribute to our understanding of this enigmatic effect. Now, OK, so in this presentation, I'd like to give you the answer to a few questions. So what exactly is the O'Connell effect? What characteristics do we see in systems that display it? And what trends do we see between these systems as well as with the O'Connell effect itself? So what is the O'Connell effect? Uh, it's an asymmetry that's seen in some eclipsing binaries uh, where the maxima between eclipses aren't equally bright, uh, which is uh, shown in this system from our sample. Something causes the leading and trailing hemispheres of one of the stars to emit different amounts of light. And there are a few theories as to what that something is. The most commonly ascribed cause is star spots, but uh, the effects of mass transfer can also be a cause. And a paper has been uh, published theorizing that it may be due to circumstellar material. The periastron effect is a possible cause in systems with eccentric orbits, but we also see the O'Connell effect in systems with circular orbits. But none of these, uh, no single theory can explain the O'Connell effect for all systems. Another much rarer asymmetry that is sometimes seen is where the minimum itself is asymmetric. This particular system also displays this asymmetry, which I'll discuss a little later in the talk, uh, but this is seen in less than 5% of the sample. So the Kepler eclipsing binary catalog was compiled by a team at Villanova University that contains almost 3,000 eclipsing binary systems that were observed by Kepler, which is a significant fraction of all known eclipsing binaries. The online catalog uh, provides the Kepler light curve, as well as the or uh, calculated orbital period of the system. Now, with such a large number of systems, the sample is statistically significant. And given how long Kepler observed the field and the precision of the observations, it's very unlikely that any eclipsing binaries were missed, which makes the uh, sample complete and well representative of nature. The large number of systems also means that a wide range of different eclipsing binaries were found. I began by manually identifying 22 initial targets, four of which are shown here. These targets were used as the training set uh, for machine learning code uh, that was used to identify uh, more targets, of which it found 57. However, I knew the program had missed many systems, and so I manually identified 71 further targets and used a code to de determine the size of the O'Connell effect to identify uh, yet a further 118 targets. I imposed a lower limit of the O'Connell effect size of 1% of the normalized flux, which split the sample into a core sample that met this cutoff and a marginal sample that didn't. The final sample consists of 244 targets, 201 in the core sample and 43 in the marginal sample. The light curves of three of the core sample targets are displayed here. As you can see, there are several different types of eclipsing binaries present in the sample. So this is a partial list of observational characteristics that I'm interested in. Uh, determining the characteristics of systems displaying the O'Connell effect will allow us to better understand what processes might cause it. For instance, if we were to find uh, that no systems with a very high temperature display the O'Connell effect, it would lead Greens to the idea that it is primarily caused by star spots, uh, which don't exist in high temperature stars. Conversely, finding a system of two hot stars displaying the O'Connell effect would require the effect in that system to be explained by another hypothesis. Uh, studying the luminosities uh, gives insight as to the evolutionary stages of the stars. Now, I've already made some progress in determining a lot of these stellar characteristics, and I'm going to kind of give an overview of that as well as show some uh, diagrams. The temperatures uh, that were reported by the Gaia mission range from 3,800 Kelvin to over 8,000 Kelvin, while the main sequence spectral types range from K5 to A2. These spectral types are derived from spectra taken of these systems, but since not all the systems were observed uh, spectroscopically, it doesn't exactly correspond to, the spectral classes don't exactly correspond to the temperature range found by Gaia. The histogram shows the uh, distribution of temperature for uh, the sample, as well as the KEBC as a whole. 
uh, the spikes that you see in there are a known artifact of the Gaia data. Now the luminosities, they range from uh, two hundredths to over 80 solar luminosities. Uh, this is a color magnitude diagram uh, that shows that most of the systems lie on the main sequence, although we do see two subgiants, two red, or excuse me, two sub dwarfs, two red dwarfs, a white dwarf, and maybe a dozen or so giants or sub, uh, yeah, subgiants. The period of the systems range over an order of magnitude from about a quarter of a day to just under 10 days. These are quite short period systems by and large. Uh, this plot shows the period distribution of the sample and again also of the KEBC. Uh, the distances that were inferred from Gaia data range from 241 parsecs, excuse me, 214 parsecs to over 8,500. Finally, this histogram shows the O'Connell effect size uh, for the entire KEBC. Most systems in the KEBC, of course, show no O'Connell effect. Uh, and the number of systems drops quite dramatically as you get to larger and larger values of the O'Connell effect. So these values, uh, this, these figures and the one on the next slide shows the comparison of many of the characteristics that I've studied. The y-axis here plots the absolute magnitude, primary eclipse depth, and morphology parameter. The morphology parameter is a measure of the shape of the light curve, with zero being widely separated stars with narrow eclipses, and one being highly over contact stars with very broad eclipses. The x-axis plots the period, O'Connell effect size, temperature, color, morphology parameter, and eclipse depth. We see that there aren't a lot of systems in the sample with a morphology parameter between 0.6 and 0.7, which is the range typically found for semi-detached systems. There also aren't a lot of well-detached systems with a significant O'Connell effect. Surprisingly, there aren't really a lot of trends that we see for the O'Connell effect size here, although there may be a weak trend between the absolute value of the uh, O'Connell effect size and the primary eclipse depth. If we look at the plot comparing those two, um, which is, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you can, it is this plot right here. Um, we see that there aren't many systems that have eclipses deeper than 0 0.5, and a higher fraction of the systems that do uh, display a significant O'Connell effect. Also, if we look at the plot comparing the eclipse depth with the morphology parameter right here, uh, we see that systems that have a significant O'Connell effect tend to have the deepest eclipses of systems with a given morphology parameter. Uh, again, the streaks that you see in the temperature plots are an artifact of Gaia. This plot shows the O'Connell effect size and temperature a period O'Connell effect size and temperature on the x-axis, a color, temperature, and O'Connell effect size on the y-axis. So there's a trend that we see between the O'Connell effect size and color. And our statistical analysis shows that similar trends exist uh, between the O'Connell effect size and period, temperature, and even though it isn't displayed, distance. Although the last of these is probably not physical and tied to the relationship between temperature and distance, which is also not shown. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about some interesting system classes that I found uh, in the process of this project. Certain systems such as this one vary quite considerably with time. You can see that the complete Kepler data set is quite a mess, but I created an animation by breaking up the data into 10 day chunks. And this is, yeah, this is that animation. We see that the eclipse depth, O'Connell effect size, and shape of the light curve uh, changes quite dramatically over a very short time scale. Again, these are each frame is about 10 days after the previous frame. One explanation for this is that uh, for this variation is that the evolution of large star spots on the surface of one of the components causes the flux to change over short time scales. An explanation that's bolstered by the fact that these systems tend to be cooler than others in the sample. Another possible explanation is that these systems might uh, feature an accretion disk and what we're seeing are instabilities in the accretion disk. Another one of these interesting system classes is one in which the system displays an asymmetric minimum, such as this one. These systems are quite rare. Only about 5% of the sample displays this effect. This asymmetry can occur in either eclipse, but is more common in the primary eclipse as it is in this system. 
these systems tend to be hotter than most of the other systems in the sample, and their light curves tend to be quite stable in time. But one very interesting thing that I've noticed is that this asymmetry is only found in systems which have total eclipses. The fact that this effect is only seen in totally eclipsing systems led me to think that maybe asymmetric minima can only be found in these systems. So I produced a model in Binary Maker 3 and found that this asymmetry is very strongly dependent on inclination, as this animation shows. As the inclination of this model increases from 74 to 77 degrees, we see the asymmetry become far more pronounced when the eclipses become total at 76 degrees, leading me to think that the asymmetry is an indicator of total eclipses. My hypothesis as to why this is, is that the excess flux that causes this asymmetry is drowned out by the sharp change in flux during the partial phase of an eclipse. But during the essentially flux consonant period of totality, it's sufficient to cause this asymmetry. There are about a dozen systems showing this effect in the sample, plus another six or so that I found in the literature. I'm hoping that you in the AAVSO community can find further examples of eclipsing binaries showing this asymmetry so that we can get a better idea of what exactly is causing it. Finally, I'd like to show some observations I've taken of some of the systems in the sample. I'm showing two of the nine systems I've observed, and they happen to be the two systems that I just uh, showed. The observations for this system were conducted over a week in September of 2018. And much of the scatter you see is because this system is very faint with a V magnitude of around 15. The data is still good enough to show that the system appears quite different from what Kepler generally saw. So apparently it's still quite variable. This system has a far more stable light curve as evidenced by the fact that this data was taken over a period of two years, yet still fits together quite well. Uh, the data is much better for the system overall, as it's nearly a full magnitude brighter than the previous system, which makes it well in the reach of the telescopes available to us. The asymmetric minimum is quite apparent in the B and V light curves, but less so in R and I. I use the Phoebe modeling software to make a preliminary model of the system. Model fit is not perfect, but considering the relative ease with which I got it, this fit, uh, combined with the difficulty I've had in modeling similar systems, the fit is surprisingly good. The model indicates a marginally over-contact system with a single hotspot on the equator of the secondary star. Now, notably, this system has a very small mass ratio of around 0.2, indicating stars of exceptionally dissimilar mass. I found this to be a common trend in the four systems I've modeled that have an asymmetric minimum. This slide presents a summary of what I've given in this presentation. I'd like to leave this up while I take any questions that you may have, but one final comment I'll make is that observing more systems displaying the O'Connell effect, and perhaps more importantly, observing such systems for an extended length of time will likely prove crucial in the future when we're ready to tackle the question of what causes this phenomenon. I believe that this is something where the AVSO community can greatly contribute to our understanding of close binaries systems. I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk and ask if there are any questions. Uh, Matthew, at this point, there are not any questions for you, but let's wait a second, see if something comes, some, let me see if somebody's typing right now. Um, yes, who, John Briggs asks, who was O'Connell? So O'Connell, uh, I don't know much about the man, but I know that he originally published uh, his work about the effect in 1951. So he was definitely one of the earlier uh, observationalists. Okay, and thank you. And Ray Tomlin, oh, John says thank you. Ray asks, Ray Tomlin asks, will you publish a list of desired observations or targets for uh so yes that's something that i could uh give out um is the list of the systems in the sample that would be something very good to now a lot of these systems are quite faint i think the brightest ones are ones are around 10th magnitude but they also go down to 17th but yes i would be more than happy to uh provide that list that would be great thank you um joyce guzik asks what would cause a hotspot at the equator of the binary star that you modeled? 
So my thinking is maybe it is a, it's one of those effects of mass transfer. Uh, now in an over contact system, it's probably not a matter stream hitting the star. Um, but I still think that the mass transfer from one component to the other might still cause this hotspot. That's kind of my leading theory. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the list of, of desired observations, we can talk about how you want to share those with the AVSO community. Okay. Um, after the meeting. Um, Sarah Beck adds a comment. O'Connell was educated in Ireland and became director of the Vatican Observatory. Ah, I didn't know that. Uh, thank you for I, I knew he was a prominent astronomer, but I, di I didn't know that he was the head of the Vatican Observatory. Um, I suspect that was partly contributed by her husband, John O'Neill, who happens to be Irish. Ah. Um, here is listening in. <laughs> um, and let's see, from Richard Roberts, are there any projects to find O'Connell effect binaries outside of the Kepler field? Um, I know that... Um, Vayu Gokhail, I think is how you pronounce his last name. I know that he is doing a lot of research on uh, the O'Connell effect himself. In fact, I am actually started contributing with him uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, he's published a few uh, articles in the JAVSO over the past couple of years uh, to that effect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Bob Buckheim says, Matthew, magnitude 10 to 12 is well within the range of some of our low resolution low resolution spectroscopist, R equals oh. 500 to 1000. Any advice on whether the time series spectra might be useful and what it's should we watch for? Extremely useful. So spectra is something that I have not been able to get of any of these systems. And it's something that I think would be very useful. The radial velocities would tell us information about the masses of the stars, which would be another important thing to know. And it, if we saw any effects such as um, emission lines, that could give us valuable information as to what may be causing this. So spectroscopy is very important and something I'm very much would be interested in getting from the community. Great. Thank you very much. I pray we don't have time for any more questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Matt. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna have a short break. Um, the break on our schedule has been a bit shortened. Um, due to presentation times today, um, but you can feel free to head over anytime starting at about in just a couple minutes um, at 20 after the hour, but feel free to go in and out of sessions however you like. The sessions we have coming up are all breakout sessions for the observing section um, breakouts. Uh, they're just discussions. Uh, they're very informal. If you're a part of one of those observing sections, feel free to head into any of them. Um, if you're curious about any of the observing sections, this is also a great time to head in and meet people who are already a part of that section, ask any questions. Um, all the session links are available at www.aavso.org slash links. So you can log out of this meeting. So it's just a red leave button at the bottom right corner of your screen. And then you can head into any of those other sessions. If you are attending the YSO session, you stay in this webinar. All right, thanks, every, thanks so much everybody. And we are wrapping up today's annual meeting in the sessions today, just so you know. See you tomorrow. I'm heading right over to the exercise session. Dennis is having a mild case of kittens over where I am. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep.
Ah, lovely. Okay, there we are. Sorry about the false colour, it's, it's just my house light. <laughs> Right. I think I think I'll probably need taking by the hand metaphorically from now on in. I've never done this before. <laughs> yes, many people are new to Zoom. I've been learning it all in the past couple months. <laughs> oh, I'm not new to Zoom. I'm just. Uh, just new to hosting. Yeah, you know, I've never hosted anything before. I've always been a, you know, a sort of passive rather than active. So everyone who's left in this webinar, we're all giving you audio permissions um, one by one. So it takes a little bit of time. Yeah. And then I'll be giving you video all one by one too. Um, like I said, this is a you know, this is a discussion, so you know you can all just um, talk and converse with each other. So I'm permitting you to all talk, and then if you still find you don't have audio, what you can do is you can go click on the microphone in the bottom left corner of your screen, and if there's a red line through it, it means you're muted. Um, click on that to unmute yourself. So if anyone has any questions about the observing section, feel free to just start asking them. Like I said, if anyone's finding they are trying to talk and they don't have audio, you can be able to change that. If not, in a minute, I am working on it. I'm going to enable chat and that way if people have problems with their audio, they can write. I have a question. Hey, Dan, what's your question. I'm trying to get to the spectroscopy section. How do I do that? Oh, to go to the spectroscopy section, you are going to click the red leave button at the bottom right corner, but don't do it till after you're ready to go. And then we're going to go to www.aso.org slash links. That should enable you to um, scroll down to the join. So you're going to click that link. It's the ice cube for the 
Google type 11. I got about half of that. Right. www.aabso.org slash links. Got that. Um, scroll down and click on the link to join the spectroscopy session. Okay. And first, okay. the red leave button in the bottom corner. Okay, thank you. Everyone's unmuted right now. Everyone should be able to talk. I'm inviting everyone to unmute. Um, they're able to post the chat. Everyone's having um, audio problems. Please let me know in the chat. If I hear background noise from you, I'm not sure if you're trying to speak. There is there is still uh, there are still quite a lot of sort of red icons up there. Yeah. Um, so maybe since no one's really talking right now and we might be having issues, we might not be. Um, and what would be what being involved in the ISO session um, details. So Mike, you know a lot better than I do what being involved in the YSO session entails. John, just introduce people to the um, YSO observing section. Sorry. Um, do you want to uh, just introduce people to the YSO observing section and tell us what the section is all about and what being involved in it entails? Okay. Okay. So welcome everyone. Uh, obviously, this is the first time all of us have been here do, doing anything like this. Um, so, so, you know, we'll try and do as best as we can, obviously. Um, yeah, basically the YSO section um, is here um, to facilitate observations 
uh, pre-main sequence stars, young variable stars generally, um, some of which actually have turned out maybe not to be that young at all, um, po possibly largely due to, to some of our observations. Um, I think, actually, I think the very existence of YSO section um, co completely divorced many observations that the members may have made is is really a good thing in itself. Um, just just cursorily examining the various alert notices that have been coming out, an increasing number of them um, have been um, about uh, various observations that are needed for this class of star. Um, that basically, because it, if you if you look at star types such as Myron's, are we doing, Myron's, are we doing um, groups? Huh? Are we uh, doing Myron's, here? binaries, and so on. They have been studying for much, much longer than YSOs. So you know, so we've got a lot of time to make up. Um, really, really, which is why we're here. Oh, so we got a bird. You know, welcome, everyone. Oh, we got a kicker. I don't know. Got any questions? Fire away. I think I think we've got some problems on the a few problems on the line there, but I. I just hope I'm coming through loud and clear. Preferably clear rather than loud. I think, I, yeah, I think, I think a few people are experiencing problems with their sound. Uh, yeah, we have uh, Syriac trying, trying to get through and can't. Ah, uh, I think he's having bandwidth problems, so there's, there's not much we can do about that, is there really? Yeah, no, I... There is nothing we can do about We're at headquarters, so I'm hoping to get through the one thing. <clears throat> um, if you wanted to um, discuss in the chat if you're having audio problems. Um, there's no way to fix audio problems on your end. Um, the only thing I can think of is to put the little arrow down next to the microphone icon. Um, and you'll want to um, select a microphone and have it be, and then select for a speaker, have it be seen as your system. And maybe do something with your audio settings. But um, if you want to have conversations, I guess a backup method is to have conversations in the chat. I have opened it. I know Siri Anch, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, this person has been trying to speak and is having some bandwidth problems. So if you want to type any questions or any comments or discussions you have, um, feel free to do so in the chat.
Um, is it possible to unmute everyone so, so at least someone, you know, someone might be able to get through? I've asked everyone to unmute a couple of times in a couple of different methods. Yeah, so, I'm unmuted now, Ed Wiley. You're coming through loud and clear. Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. <clears throat> Sorry, I was away eating. I <laughs> I just picked up the uh, unmute. Uh, do you have any questions about the uh, YSO section or do you want to add anything about what the YSO section is involved in? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. Uh, okay. Enjoyed the talk, but uh, no questions for me. Okay. Should I unmute now? You can unmute. Yeah. Okay. If you're, you know, you can unmute or mute yourself as you want to talk. Yep. And it could be that some people are just um, still in the session, but away. And that could be part of it with audio as well. Edward brings up a good point. Yeah, I think, are we still technically so, in the break? So, so people have just kind of left for a while. Yeah, possibly. Um, so if I won not, so I am not involved in the YSO section. If I want to get involved, what would be the steps I would take? Um, you go to the uh, sections part of the AABSO website, and and you can, uh, or basically you can join from there. So it's it's really simple. And so, do I participate mainly and discuss um, any questions I have about YSOs with um, other people in the forum? Or is there, are there Zoom meetings? How does everyone connect with each other? Yeah, the YSO we, section. We do have the YSO forum. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of as far as we've got at the moment. I, I, think, I think we're one of the newer, you know, one of the newer sections. Um, so it's not just the stars it's the it's members as well. <laughs> um, so when does um, the thing stop then being a young stellar object and turn into not a young stellar object? Ah, oh, well, you see, we need more observations. <laughs> ah, um, no, that's I mean, where all the uh, observing comes in. <laughs> uh, something else we do. Um, I produce a monthly YSO newsletter, uh, which basically contains, um, you know, notices, uh, news, uh, stars to follow. Um, it contains a few excerpts from what's called the Star Formation Newsletter, which used to be produced by uh, Bo Ryper at the University of Hawaii. Um, I think last month, I think he he turned over the editorship to, to somebody else, um, uh, but he's obviously still, still very active in the field. Um, and the Star Formation Newsletter is still being produced. Um, it's 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 a very eclectic sort of publication. I mean, you know, you'll get articles on, yeah, you know, sort of straight off variable stars. You know, as we would recognise it, you'll get articles on interstellar chemistry and all, all all sorts of stuff. So there's usually something in there that's going to be of interest to AABSA members. I mean, sp speaking personally, um, I'm purely a visual observer. Um, I've sort of studied them kind of quite a bit because obviously being in Britain, you know, we don't have that much observing time. Um, so I have the time to, you know, to kind of research and, um, you yeah, know, kind of what's going on. Um, and of course, we've, we've, got the very, uh, we've got the very knowledgeable scientific advisor in, in Professor Bill Herbst. So, you know, we've got all the resources. Um, That's great. Yeah. Yeah, if anyone wants the YSO Bulletin, um, can you join it on the website? Can you request subscription to it? Um, I believe, to it? Um, uh, the way it's working at the moment is if you send me an email, I will I will put you on the list. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and so if you go to the YSO um, observing page and you, you, there you should, um, next to there's a contact button. Um, that's how you get in touch with uh, Michael Poxon here. Um, his YSO bulletin is also available in AABSO Communications, our monthly um, e-newsletter. It comes out once a month on the first Tuesday of every month. Um, and there's a bunch of updates of what AABSO has going on and different things you can do. Uh, 
different promotional material we have out or different educational videos that our um, ambassadors put together. Our ambassadors are volunteers for the AVSO that conduct a lot of education and outreach material um, outside of the observing sections, although occasionally they work with the observing sections as well. Um, oh, and the ability to subscribe to our monthly newsletter if you haven't but want to um, is in your um, profile or account settings when you log into AAVSO. So, uh, yes, uh, so something else we also have um, are links to back issues. So, in fact, you know, you don't even have to be a member of the section. You can, you can just simply link to, uh, to a back issue and have a look. And, you know, if, it, if it's for you, fine. If it isn't for you, then, you know, that's fine as well. But I would like to think that it is for you. Uh, we have Bob, Bob Buckheim, who's raised his hand. Hey, hi, Michael. This is uh, Buckheim. Uh, yeah. I just wanted wanted to let you know I, I enjoy your newsletter. Um, I have struggled through Bo Reipert's uh, uh, papers, and uh, I can understand yours a lot easier. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you you mentioned that that you're primarily a visual observer. Is there a role? Uh, for visual observing in the young stellar object world? Oh, yes. I mean, basically, there's kind of a role for everyone, really. Um, uh, if you're doing something like kind of uh, multi wavelength photometry, um, then that's just as good um, because all these things are complementary. Um, on, if I just think think back to something that has got absolutely nothing to do with YSOs, in fact, it's the other end of the age spectrum. Um, there was there was an article, oh, it must have been about 15, 20 years ago, um, in the AAVSO journal, sh showing how uh, T. Ursi Minoris had radically changed its period. Now, the only reason we know that is because we have lots of observations going back a long way and continuing observations as well so it's 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 kind of similar uh, uh, with YSOs for most of them obviously because it's a you know comparatively it's a fairly uh, new field of study uh, you know we've got uh, observations of SS Cygni and you know and Myra you know going back over 100 years um, if, if we look at stars like RW Origi or RR Tauri, then uh, we have fairly com comparatively uh, uh, long-ranging long observations of those stars. But, uh, but for sort of 75, 80% of YSOs, they have only really just, just started to be observed with any uh, great concentration, uh, probably over the past 10, 15 years. So, you know, we've got a lot of time to make up. And that's why we need lots of observations and lots of different sorts of observations as well. So, you know, there's a, you know, there's a place for everyone. Even, even us poor old visual observers who just use our eyes. <laughs> that's good. Um, and regarding CCD photometry, um, you know, there, there's, there are some targets that uh, the emphasis is on getting high signal to noise ratio and multicolor uh, uh, and other targets like cataclysmic variables. The emphasis is as rapid a, a, a cadence as possible, uh, even at the sacrifice of filtering and uh, to some degree sacrificing signal to noise ratio. Uh, uh, any comments on uh, special requirements or uh, things to consider in CCD photometry of YSOs? I, uh, yeah, um, I, th I think this tends to depend on uh, uh, various targets. Um, there is, at the moment, in fact, as we speak, um, there is um, a program underway to observe T tauri stars. Um, in Orion, um, a couple of associations in uh, around the Orion Nebula, not in not in the nebula itself, not your sort of you know classic sort of T, T Orionis and all this sort of thing. Um, these ones are in slightly different um, 
tea, tea associations um, up, up near Orion's Belt. Um, and um, early, um, early next year, I think spring next year, there's going to be um, a similar program observing far southern uh, young stars. Um, but just, just to kind of get back, going, going slightly off at a tangent there, obviously, um, to get back to your actual question, um, with, with some stars, we know uh, that we need high cadence photometry. Um, stars, um, I'm thinking RW Aurigi, SE Aurigi, um, stars that have recently got, gone through um, very, very strange periods, deep, very deep minima, um, kind of unprecedented, really. Um, and obviously at those times, um, you know, the fast cadence, also the rapid cadence, uh, was very, very important, um, as, what, as was the multi-wavelength observations as well, because it's only by, uh, by looking, say, at the distance between the B curves and the B curves and, and, the, uh, and the infrared uh, information uh, that we can get a better idea of, of what's physically going on there. And there are, there are, some, there are some pretty weird things going on. What, what kind of weird things? Oh, well, especially in the case of R.W. Aurigi, um, we've got evidence for a, a huge amount of gas be, being torn out of the uh, circumstellar disk by, uh, uh, by its companion, because I, I believe R.W. Aurigi is binary or possibly triple. It's, it's, cer it's certainly binary at the minimum. Um, and it appears that um, the companion has disrupted the uh, circumstellar disk and it's kind of flinging it all over the system really <laughs> it's, a, it's quite strange what's going on there oh interesting oh yeah yeah and of course it's it's coming up right about now as well so train that train that telescope on it <laughs> uh, the last time i looked at it it was it was still fainter than normal it was about um sort of 11 and a half magnitude that sort of thing um, that's yeah, that's slightly fainter than you would expect to see it. Uh, yeah, I mean, not much. But, but, but when it went through that, that phase, it, it was down below uh, 13th magnitude. In fact, I'm also on the uh, sequence uh, team as well. And we had to make, you know, a deeper sequence because the existing comparison stars didn't actually feel faint enough. So uh, I hope we've managed to take care of that. Okay. Lots of lovely questions, eh? Cheers, Bob. Yeah. Okay. So R. W. Arrighi is uh, yeah should be high on our list for the next several months. Yes, it certainly should. And of course, the other, but another good thing about uh, some of these objects is they are just simply very, very active. And consequently, the lots of fun to observe. Pure, you know, purely on an amateur level, they are they are really fun to observe because you, if you take a star like say R R Tauri, uh, you might look at it tonight and it'll be magnitude ten, and you look at it tomorrow and it will gone down to magnitude thirteen or something like that. It's always doing something. You know, in in either uh, either of the two stars we've been talking about, is there? It sounds like in R. W. Arrighi, there's a companion, so presumably there's an orbital period that should show up in photometry. Um, it, it it might well do. Um, I'm not quite I'm not quite sure about the separation between the components. Um, I think. Um, I think Arne might, might know that. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't know whether any anything has been revealed about that. To be absolutely honest, um, I've got another question here. It was from uh, Surian, who, who was trying to get through earlier and couldn't. Um, his question is: Can young stellar observing be done 
from the backyard by using low-grade scopes? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, in fact, one star, you don't even need a telescope for a B or a G, um, which is a very interesting star anyway. A B or a G is, is visible at all stages with nothing more than a pair of binoculars. So, you, you know, in fact, for that one, you don't even need a telescope. Um, and the interesting thing about A B or a G is it's a double star. It's, uh, it's an easy, separable double star. Its companion is SU Origi, which is also a YSO. It's, it's slightly fainter. It's about between 9th and 10th magnitude. So even if you've got a good pair of binoculars, you probably get both of them at the same time. But certainly, a, you know, a very small telescope will uh, show those two stars. Absolutely no problem. Um, and one of my favourites, um, which is a very, very active star indeed, um, is CQ Tauri, um, which varies roughly between magnitudes 9 and sort of 11. So, you know, again, a very small telescope uh, will find that. And with that, you need observations every single night because it's very, very active. Um, in fact, there was one stage when I was observing it uh, quite a few years ago now, probably about 20 years ago, um, when I actually saw it fade before my eyes as I looked at it. Um, I'm not quite sure whether that observation has been confirmed or not, but um, yeah, um, please observe that one because it's very active. Um, and if you, if you get stars like that and they're doing something, you know, it's really good because, you know, you can actually watch them uh, doing something. And when you consider that uh, really basically what these stars are doing is forming planets um, most of the time that's what they're doing that's that's what the circumstellar disks are doing um, you know it's 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 just a good thought you know as you're watching it uh, you are watching you know the formation of a solar system somewhere you know somewhere out in deep space so really apart from the science angle you know it's 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 kind of a wonderful thing to do anyway, you know, because you're kind of watching creation in action, really. You know, this is what the sun was doing four billion years ago. It was doing exactly the same thing. So, you know, there might have been an astronomer a hundred light years away watching the sun. Like, oh, look, there's a T Tauri star. Um, so, yeah, to answer your question, Suri, and yes, you, you most certainly can use a, you know, a perfectly ordinary telescope without any bells and whistles. I mean, I use um, a 14 inch Dobsonian. Um, but, but, you know, some, something small like a 150 millimeter uh, telescope is, is perfectly adequate for lots of these stars. So, yes, yes, you certainly can. That's the answer to that one. I know that we've got Pradip Kamarkar there, um, who isn't, apparently isn't muted. Um, I mean, if you can't get through, I'm sorry, I don't know whether you're male or female. Um, if, you, if you can't get through, then maybe you would like to uh, put your question through, through chat or, or questions and answers. Just a thought. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, have we seen the question from Suri Yansh Saxena? Yes, I've just answered yep. that one. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's when I answered. I was in another session. I was making sure every other session was working. You're a very busy lady. <laughs> Missed it for a little bit. <laughs> 
Yes, I, I just think it's quite hectic there, isn't it? All, all this stuff going on. It's virtually oh, you should see on. my piles of sticky notes. <laughs> sticky notes Sorry, baseball I'm, sheets. I'm, I'm right, yeah. <laughs> Little yellow bits of paper everywhere. Has everyone had more time for um, observing since um, quarantine started and everything? Oh, dear. <laughs> I think they were talking about that in a couple other sessions. They've hit that topic. <laughs> well, I suppose that's a good that's a good thing about astronomy, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, it can be a very kind of solitary thing. You know, you don't need masses of people together, do you? No, it's yeah. nice that people find the solitary activity, but you know, they also, you know, there are also star parties, you know, in their um, community, you know, astronomy clubs. Yeah, um, exactly. Small, and they've popped on Zoom, and I know some of them have also like joined together. So they have joint Zoom sessions some weeks. I know some of them have started doing that. So it's really great to see um, the entire astronomy community kind of um, get together, even though it's such oh, a solitary yeah, yeah. activity. They still get together yeah. and they still talk and they still share their data and they still share how to you know develop astrophotometry, astrophotography. Yeah, nice oh, I mean last. Uh, last night, I was at a Zoom meeting with um, an astronomy club up in the north of the country. Um, and I think I think the night before that, I was with another one, you know, nearby as well. Um, in fact, at the moment, um, we have a thing in, in Britain called Astro Speakers, which it, it's basically a database of, you know, uh, societies, uh, but also speakers, you know, who are willing to... Uh, Kind of offer their services um and i'm actually redesigning their website at the moment because now um i mean really what they've got is a, um, a sort of a map of britain you know with your area kind of wherever you are um but now they want the website completely redesigned uh, because now they've got to take into account you know i mean you could have a speaker say uh, yeah, okay, I'm here in Britain, you know, talking to you in the States by Zoom. Uh, you know, so really, er everyone everyone can do that now. So, you know, it's not just Britain they want to include, they want to include everyone. So that's, you know, that's kind of going ahead as well. Cool. Yeah. You know, ABSO has a search to, of, um, you can find people in your area. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Safe to say, there's no, there's no one in my area. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> just, you have luck. There's no one. <laughs> just, just me stuck out in. Uh, well, uh, you know, there's this idea that um, sort of maps of various countries can sort of look like you know everyday objects. You know, like a map of I don't know, uh, you know, Costa Rica uh, might look like a you know might look like a running dog or something. Well, apparently, the map of Britain is supposed to look like an old woman riding a pig. Um, I've never heard that. That is interesting. Uh, yeah. Yes, basically, uh, sort of, uh, Scotland is the old woman and she's kind of wearing a bonnet. Uh, Wales, over to the west, is a pig's head. Um, and a bit along, the kind of bits along the English Channel are the sort of pig's legs where it's running. Um, and I live in the in the bit of pig that you really wouldn't want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> I shall say no more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope everyone else is laughing, even though like their audio is off, and it's not just me laughing and thinking this is hysterical. <laughs> everyone else is laughing behind their computer screens as well. <laughs> Well, uh, Buckheim again, I find myself wondering if anyone in the audience has been actively looking at YSOs and has any stories to tell. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Oh, the check's in the post, by the way, Bob. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, well, you kind of kept me going by answering all these questions so I, you know, I thought it's only fair to you know oh. to put, to put a check in the post <laughs> sure that. your honorarium <laughs> such as it is yeah. 
Come on, somebody out there in the community must have something to say. Yeah, and if for some reason you're having problems with your audio, just put it in the chat and we'll, you know, read it out loud to everybody. Yeah. Well, Q&A, well, you go Q&A. Actually, I, I do have a question that's got absolutely nothing to do with what I says. Um, I, 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 I'd be quite interested in, in going to the uh, CV breakout. Um, could you tell me just how I do that? You'd be interested in going into what? Uh, the CVs. Oh, the CVs. So if you want to go to CVs, um, you certainly can. You would have to click the red leave button at the bottom yeah. right. But before you do that, let me finish telling you how to get there. Um, you'll want to go to www.aavso.org slash links. Okay. And CVs is actually... Uh, it's, uh, it's on Sunday. It's on Sunday. Oh, right, okay. So you'll go in so on sunday you'll um click to leave out of the main webinar when it's time to go on break or go to the sessions and yeah. so leave and then you'll go to www.abso.org links and then the cv section is if you scroll down a bit you'll find a link and a passcode you may or may not ask for a passcode but if it does the passcode's listed there too the passcode for all the sessions is the same i made it 11 make it nice and simple but um, the same way you entered sessions today is the same way you're going to enter sessions Sunday. Okay. Oh, that's, that's great. Thanks very much. Frank Dempsey says, my comment is thanks for bringing YSOs to our attention myself, and I plan to start observing YSCOs. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's what we, that's what we want to hear. I'm really running out of money here, putting all these checks in the post. <laughs> I'd be I'd be bankrupt. <laughs> Is observing YS, um, YSOs with um, one type of equipment better than observing with other types of equipment? Oh, it's it's definitely horses and courses. Um, you know, if you want. Uh, for instance, a lot of YSOs um, show fa uh, fairly small variability at, at some stages because uh, they're fast rotators um, and so they're usually fairly heavily spotted and obviously the period of rotation um, ca can be calculated by, uh, you know, the recurrence pattern of the spots as they, yeah, as they come around and disappear. Um, so that that's that sort of variation really isn't suitable for visual observing um that's where your ccds come in um, but on the other hand if you want continuous long-term monitoring then that's when the visual stuff comes in useful so you know there's yeah it's kind of bits of sort of bits for everyone Re really much like any other class of variable star you know a lot of the things we know about, say, a star like uh, ZCAM or SS Cygni, um, depends on almost long-term variations that, you know, people like the BAA, VSS, AA, VSO, AFOEV, um, you know, people like that have made over, you know, over a long period of time. Um, so, so really, they, you know, the situation is, isn't that different from any, you know, from anything else. Um, Plus, they, you know, they're quite exciting as well. I, I like to think so, but then again, I'm biased. Can you observe YSOs visually? Oh dear, not. Um, do, uh, when you say visually, do you sort of oh. mean with? Do you mean with the naked eye or? Oh, with the naked eye or with binoculars? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I said, um, uh, uh, some something that was uh, being asked earlier. Actually, it was it was while you were away. Um, um, yes, yeah, someone asked whether you can observe YSOs with, you know, just kind of uh, modest equipment. Um, and yes, um, in fact, you don't even need a telescope. Um, AB Aurigi, um, which is in the Taurus Auriga star forming region, um, 
is visible at all stages with nothing more than a pair of binoculars. Um, it varies from magnitude seven down to about eight and a half. Um, and in fact, it's a double star and its companion is also a YSO, which um, it's also reasonably bright as well. It's not strictly a binocular star, but a very small telescope will actually show both of them side by side. It's, it's a very wide double star. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, you don't need fabulous equipment with, you know, with all the bells and whistles. Just a, just a perfectly ordinary backyard telescope. Absolutely fine. That's great. Oh, yeah. So you've got no excuse. No, I don't. Except for the fact that I live in Quincy, Massachusetts, and there's um, lots of light pollution. Is anyone else experiencing incredibly horrific light pollution where they live that's preventing them from observing nightly where they live? You have to make a trip of it to get out to observing? Well, you know, something as bright as uh, AB Auriga that uh, Michael's talking about, light pollution shouldn't be that big an impediment. Oh, really? Huh. Interesting. I mean, after all, you, you know, binoculars, you ought to be able to see it practically through the city lights. My old apartment, I don't think so, but in my new, in my, the car, <laughs> my current apartment, yes. My old apartment had um, three big, it was next to an auto garage. And at night, they had three huge, like glaring, you know, those, I don't even know what they're called, like floodlights, spotlights. They had three of them in a very concentrated area. It was horrible. I couldn't see a thing. <laughs> but most people aren't right next to three floodlights. <laughs> The, the other thing, uh, Michael, that, that uh, strikes me as interesting about something like A.B. Auriga is it is bright enough uh, that quite a few small telescope spectrographs should be able to deal quite nicely with it, uh, including at fairly high resolution uh, and, and see what's going on there uh, in the spectrum as it wiggles. Yes. Um, um... AB Aurigi is, um, because there are various types of YSO, um, AB Aurigi um, is what's called the UX Orion star. Um, basically, the, the, the light curve um, nor, normally takes the form where it, it, looks, it looks slightly like an Algol star. In fact, some of these stars, when they were first discovered, they were thought to be Algol stars. Um, it tends to spend most of, uh, most of its time at or around maximum um, and from time to time and unpredictably um, you know it will dip down to a sort of eighth or eight and a half magnitude uh, minimum um, and as I say you know these uh, these times are unpredictable which is why these stars need con constant monitoring because you, you know you never know when it's going to happen um, this is actually what we got with uh, with SU Origi about a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, it was quite interesting. Um, I was due to give a talk. This was when it was joint, joint A of ESO BAA meeting at the University of Warwick. It was, right in the, it was right in the middle of a heat wave. That I do remember. Uh, it was also in the middle of the World Cup. <laughs> um, I, was, I was due to give a talk there about a completely different star. Um, but literally two days before the meeting, I had an email from uh, a guy in Belgium, Bart Stales, um, who said, I think you should take a look at SU Aurigi. It's just gone through a, a very deep fade. Um, and in fact, it's an unprecedented fade. If, if, you, look in, if, if you look in some of the old, old literature, it gives the range of SU Aurigi as about 9 to 9.5. So, you know, not much change going on there. Um, but, uh, on this occasion, it had gone down to 10.8. Um, so I actually ch changed the subject of the talk to SU Aurigi. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you know, they always spring surprises. It did when when it did that that gigantic fade? Did the color change? Uh, yes, in in fact, Bart managed to get multi-wavelength photometry of it, and it it faded in every, um, you know, in every single wave band. Oh, um, usually by, you know, a comparable amount. Um, 
which which was weird um, and would tend to indicate that there was solid matter between us and it, you know, because uh, light of all wavelengths uh, was being absorbed. Um, so, I mean, that kind of in itself is interesting, really. Um, and another star um, that's very, very interesting and is actually on, on view at the moment is Al Zed Piskin, or if you're in the States, Al Zed Piskin. We call it Zed here. Um, <laughs> uh, it was actually thought to be a YSO. Um, in fact, I thought it was a YSO because I wrote a paper about it. Um, but it seems what's actually going on there is uh, what we are seeing. It's another it, it's another one of these UX or Iris stars that spends most of its time at maximum and occasionally plummet, plummets down by a couple of magnitudes probably to a 13th magnitude minimum. Again, it, it's not fabulously faint, so you know, a small telescope will show it. Um, yes, what we have there isn't actually a circumstellar disk. We think it's a debris disk. So it's already formed, it's probably already formed its planets, but now the planets are smashing into each other and creating what's, uh, what's called a debris disk. Because if you look at the colors, um, nor, uh, normally you can, uh, you can tell a bona fide YSO um, by the difference uh, between the B minus V and, and, and the J minus K. Um, the J minus K will always be uh, bigger, in fact, usually much bigger, uh, than the B minus V. And uh, the reason is um, the J minus K uh, uh, magnitude is a guide to the fact that there's a circumstellar disk which is radiating in the infrared. So, uh, so you get a strong infrared access. But in the, in the case of Ars Episcio, you don't get that. So it it doesn't have, it probably, you know, you've got to say probably, it probably uh, doesn't have, um, you know, the classics and the planet, planet forming disks because it's already formed planets. Yeah, as I say, I, you know, we think what's happening is it's now actually got a debris disk uh, caused by uh, the sort of embryonic planets, you know, you know kind of, Crash, crashing into each other, so it's also all sorts of exciting stuff going on there. Um, when it when it fades, is is the fade sort of clumpy and fluctuating, or does it uh, uh, you know no, like no. A, a thick area in the disc, or actual particles? Well. Well, with this particular star, uh, because normally with these UX or IN stars, um, yes, the fades are sort of fairly quick, you know, over the course of, I don't know, um, a few days maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Those uh, though some have very precipitous fades. Um, uh, but usually, <coughs> uh, yeah, usually um, uh, the fades take, take kind of several days uh, to, uh, to actually undergo. Um, but when Arzepiskin fades, it fades very, very quickly. Um, and it doesn't stay at minimum for very long. Um, and, and the fades, because in some cases with these UX or Rhino stars, they are kind of uh, semi-regular fades. Um, but here, uh, the fades are, would appear to be completely random which is you know which also kind of leads into the theory that you know it's a debris disk and you know uh, there are chaotic processes going on i.e the planets smashing into each other and you know you've got planetesimals like comets and po possibly asteroids going on as well um so it's you know it's in a huge state of flux um but you get uh, some of these stars uh, uh, some of the UX or Iris types, which are the really, I think they're really interesting ones. Um, we're fairly sure what's happening in the case of them is they are actively forming planetary systems because the fact that they undergo um, semi, semi periodic phase would tend to indicate that you've got a fairly kind of low inclination. So, you know, it's a bit like looking at an eclipse, really. Um, 
and the sort of forming planets, the material that's going to go on to form the planets, is effectively kind of eclipsing the host star, and that's what causes the fate. And obviously, if it, you know, if it's a sort sort of semi regular, if I think of a star like V seven thirty CPI, which is a fairly recent discovery, um, it shows it shows. It shows fades at stages of about a fortnight. Um, you know, so yeah, we think there's there's something going round it, you know, which is causing the star to fade. And we think that something is, is probably a forming planet or even or even possibly a system of planets. Um, but you can sometimes actually watch this stuff going on in real time. So, you know, that's interesting, you know, kind of watching planets being formed as you you know, kind of as you wait. <laughs> Hmm. But that's 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 certainly very interesting stuff to follow. Um, it's it's slightly complicated by the fact that it's bang, it's it's bang next to an eighth magnitude star, um, and it's thirteenth magnitude at maximum. So you know, if you're observing it visually, you do need to use fairly high power. Just going to have a look and see if we've got any more questions and answers. Uh, got that one. That's done. The main question appears to be how do I get to the spectroscopy section? <laughs> <laughs> Which I feel awfully slighted um, by. Hadith asks Is it possible <laughs> to ask about Cepheid, sorry if I mispronounced that, and RR Larry CCD images? Uh, not quite sure what they mean. Um, because they're not young stars. They're old stars, in fact. Um, so, Pradip, maybe you want to clarify your question? The cat? Yeah, uh, while we're waiting for any any clarification what might be coming, something I haven't actually mentioned um, are, are people who like to take pretty pictures. Um, I've, I've got a friend who does this. He actually does it on a sort of semi-professional basis, I suppose. Um, he's one of Britain's leading astrophotographers. Uh, strange thing is we actually uh, grew up together in, in the same, you know, in the same town, in fact, in the same street. We lived opposite each other. Although at the time, you know, he wasn't interested in astronomy. Any, anyway, that's irrelevant. Um, he is an absolute top class imager. Um, I have pointed, you know, I've pointed out to him several times that um, his pictures aren't just pretty pictures, but they could have actual sort of, you know, they could have some scientific importance. Because uh, lots of the things that he likes to image are nebulae. And of course, that's where you find YSOs. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm slowly trying to convert it to the variable star cause. Um, Pradip is asking if you can say something about Cepheids and R.R. Leary, and of course. Hello. Hello, we hear you. Are you hear me? Yes. Oh. So, uh, uh, actually, I'm very much interested about the field of techniques and RLI light curve analysis and period chain analysis. Okay. So, uh, at present, uh, it is not possible for me to take the CCD images using the telescope. So, uh, in future, I would like to do some analysis on M5. In M5, there are two. Uh, <clears throat> variables V42 and V84, okay? And we have, I studied some papers that uh, these two uh, these two variables have period change um, characteristics. So uh, I would like to uh, do some work on these two variables. If I get the opportunity to get some recent images, CCD images, did 
on the line so I, I didn't I didn't really get the, I didn't really get the gist I'm afraid um, could 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 you possibly do it as um, a sort of question and answer question would that be okay but I do I, right. I, I get the impression that you're asking about RR Lyrae and uh, CFID variables um, I, I don't really know anything about them um, I really study young stars and they're all old stars so um, oh. I'm not, you know, I'm personally not really qualified to, to sort of talk about them. Yeah, I sort of know what they oh. are and how they work, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't really give you any advice because that's not my field. I'm sorry. Okay, okay, it's okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. If anyone else knows about them though and wants to answer his question, you certainly may. Um, this might be, if no one has an answer, um, Pradip, this might be a really good question to ask on one of our forums. Are you familiar with the AVSS okay. forum? Okay. Yeah, it might be a good place to ask that question thank there, and then I'm sure someone would have an answer for you. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think our time is actually wrapped up now. Um, thank you all so much for attending the annual meeting today. It begins at 1600 UT tomorrow. I think I know in that email I sent out, I said 1100 UT. Um, so 1600 UT tomorrow, which is 11 a.m. Eastern, it's 8 a.m. Pacific, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thank you all so much for coming and we'll see you tomorrow in our presenters. And Thank you also to our sponsors, QHYCCD, Optical Structures, Obstech, um, First Light Observatory Systems, and iTelescope. Um, they all help make this possible. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, and I hope you have a great rest of your day, night, evening, whatever it <laughs> night. be, wherever in the world you are. I think it's meant to be clear, actually. <laughs> <laughs>